meeting of the joint federal state task force on electric transmission to consider the matters that have been posted in the agenda issued on June 30th, uh, 2022 and docket AD 2115. This meeting is on the record and a transcript will be placed into the docket. The public can listen and observe in the room and online. Any comments by the public can be submitted into the docket through FERC's e-filing system, which is available at the FERC website. Today's discussion will avoid the merits of any pending contested matter, and I will interrupt discussions if we enter that territory. Task force members can address matters raised in pending proceedings generally, but should not speak to the specific merits of a pending contested matter. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chairman Rich Glick and Maryland Public Service Commission Chair Jason Stanek. Thank you very much, Matt. And I want to thank everybody for, for coming today and uh, participating. So, uh, this is our fourth now, fourth task force meeting, I believe. And uh, the first three, I think, have gone beyond my wildest expectations. I think they've been very informative, very uh, sub substantial. Uh, we've, we've made a lot of progress. And I think, you know, I think hopefully you see it in the two um, uh, proposed rulemakings that FERC has uh, issued recently on transmission, one of them being on planning and cost allocation and the second on interconnection reform. And both, I think, contain some very good ideas, uh, uh, many of which were um, as a result of the discussion, discussions that we've had over the last um, several months. So again, I wanna thank everybody for doing this. It's very helpful. And, um, you know, I, I think today's subject is just as important as the, the discussions that we've had so far on interregional transmission. Um, I think everyone knows that back in Order 1000, FERC set up a process for uh, the regions to work together in terms of developing an approach to considering and planning for interregional transmission and also allocating the costs associated with that transmission. And I think it was, uh, although it was well intentioned, we've seen over the last decade or so that there actually hasn't been any interregional transmission built as a result of that process. So we're in a situation now where we, we, at least I believe we need to consider are there reforms that are necessary um, uh, to move forward. Now, I think when, when we look, the first question you have to ask is, are there a lot of benefits with interregional transmission? Do we really need to promote more interregional transmission development? And I will just again point to an example we use on occasion, which is look what happened during winter storm Uri. Now, Texas and ERCOT are a unique situation. There's, um, because they're, not necessarily somewhat islanded, very little connection to the rest of the grid. But look at the, the, the dramatic cold weather that occurred uh, in February of 2020. And uh, obviously, uh, Texas lost power for several days. At least a good part of ERCOT lost power for several days. And we saw what happened. A couple hundred people died literally just because they didn't have access to power. Meanwhile, in SPP and MISO, they also had very similar weather conditions and they lost a lot of electric generation facilities as well and some gas facilities as well but there they did have some rolling blackouts were very limited and the reason is, is because they were connected to other re regions of the country including pjm they were able to wheel in a lot of power and fortunately it wasn't as cold in pjm at the time and the the, the, the results were so were, were remarkably different and i think that's just one example there's a lot of benefits to interregional transmission but reliability and uh, you know, public safety is one of them. And so I think this is something we need. We, so we need to consider, and, and I know we're gonna be talking about today, what changes are necessary to the Order 1000 process to promote interregional transmission? What are the benefits associated with interregional transmission? What are the costs, what are the difficulties associated with moving forward on this? And I know we're gonna have a very good discussion today. So I look forward to hearing from all my colleagues, but before I turn it over to, to Chair Stanek, I wanna again, thank Dr. Rob. He's moderated so well for us and, and has agreed to do it again. So thank you again, Dr. Rob, and look forward to an excellent discussion today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's good to, to be back uh, with the, the task force. As you noted, our fourth task force meeting, eight months later and four NOPRs later, uh, this collaborative has begun to, to bear fruit. Uh, this forum obviously has allowed state regulators and our federal counterparts to collaborate, work on issues that have effectively vexed our energy sector for, for decades. And we've begun to address some of the most challenging topics of transmission reform, starting with our first meeting in Louisville back in November uh, of last year. I agree with, with much of what Chair Glick has just stated, but at the same time, I know many of us are, are frustrated. 
it should not be this difficult to string new line from states to states and within regions. I, th I think back to another Sheraton ballroom that many of us were in back in 2006, where FERC had a technical conference where the aim was to promote regional transmission and cost allocation issues. And that was in the Sheraton in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which ultimately germinated into what we now have as, as Order 890. Uh, the efforts are, are not for, for naught, but literally uh, these many years later, we're still addressing some of the, the root causes that have prevented us from building needed transmission across the coast. As Chair Glick just said, inter-regional issues uh, now loom large. 32 parties filed comments in response to the ANOPR, explicitly implicating the need for inter-regional transmission to become a priority. The fact of the matter is that less than 10% of transmission lines in service are of the vintage of 2013 or newer. So over the past effectively 10 years, only at best 10% of the lines are new. We recognize that we, we have to do more to connect the interconnects, to connect the RTOs, in order to unlock some of the new sources of, of generation. I look around this table and there's two out of the five top producing solar states here, California and North Carolina. There's two out of five of the top wind producing states here, California and Kansas. Obviously, since that last meeting at the Sheraton, much has changed. Public policies have changed, resource preferences have changed. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation. This is a big issue that has yet to be tackled. Um, and we'll have a full agenda of, of good discussions amongst the states. Uh, again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Rob, as well as the Nehru staff and our personal staff for getting us ready for today. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just go over just a few housekeeping things and then talk right about how we've designed the agenda and then we'll get right into it. Um, one, as you've seen demonstrated when you're speaking, if you could take your mouse off, then we can all hear you better. And then uh, please put them back in. You know already how to use mics, but if you can speak directly into the mic, then everybody who's in the room, which is getting hacked and also uh, live streaming, will be able to hear you. Um, I wanted to also say that um, Chairman Nelson, who's also on the task force from Massachusetts, he's has a video link in today. He wasn't able to be here, so he'll be here um, uh, by video. And um, and then I just wanted to also really thank the FERC staff and the NARIC staff who have worked with me over the last couple of months to design today's meeting. It, um, so it was a team effort. So we're looking forward to a really productive um, meeting again today. Couple, two reminders. One is that Remember, this is a regulatory proceeding and it's both allowed and expected that we'll have a spirited back and forth discussion among all the task force members, uh, FERC and state commissioners and chairs alike. And a reminder just to the state commis commissioners and chairs that although you're here in theory representing your region, we also know that there's a lot of interesting things going on in your state and your personal observations. So. We'll be expecting that you're representing your region, but when you want to say something about your state, just be clear that that's what you're doing. That will just help us there. So in terms of the game plan for today, we have actually two topics that we're covering. The first, um, which both the co-chairs referenced, was the uh, interregional transmission planning and transmission project development, and we'll spend the majority of the meeting on that, that's a new topic for uh, the task force. So we'll go to roughly 3.30 on that topic. We'll take a roughly half an hour break. I don't wanna cut things off if, if we're still going strong, so we might shorten the break a little bit. And then um, we'll come back for our second topic, which is feedback from the states, followed by a discussion of the whole task force on FERC's first NOPR that was released in April on regional transmission planning and cost allocation. And I'll say more about that when we get there. And then we'll have some closing remarks um, from 5.15 to 5.30. So any, any questions before we, we get right into the first topic? 
And then I, you know, you're all well trained, but if you want, if you want to speak, just put your tent card up and um, then we have one for Chairman Nelson um, over there. So, so the first topic is on interregional transmission planning and transmission project development. And we've purposefully broken this into three um, discussions that we're hoping will build on each other. So we want to start with a discussion of what, what, are, what do people feel like are the most important opportunities for interregional? And I'll say a bit more about that before we launch. Uh, and what barriers exist to that right now? So we'll start with the classic sort of opportunities and barriers discussion, and then we'll move into a, how should we specifically improve the planning, coordination, and cost allocation associated with interregional transmission effectively to overcome the barriers and capture the opportunities. And then third, because this is all, as you've heard from the co-chairs, funneling into the NOPA process um, most immediately, but also what, what states and RTOs are doing. But what are the most important action for FERC and others to take to facilitate the planning and development of these interregional projects? So that's how we'll, we'll end. Um, and then um, to get started, we're gonna do each one, each of those three discussions a little bit differently than we've done in the past. For the first opportunities and barriers, we're actually gonna go around the table and give everybody one to two minutes just to tell us what are the most important opportunities that you, what you're thinking of when you're thinking of in a regional and what are the most significant barriers? You don't have to be comprehensive because by the time we get all the way around, I think we'll have a really good list. And then we'll go back to having a discussion first about the opportunities and the barriers before we go on. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more how we'll do the other ones when we get there, but uh, why don't we just go ahead and, and get started. We're gonna start with, with Chair French and work our way all the way back around to the co-chairs. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm really excited to be having this meeting. Um, it, it's time we talk about interregional transmission. Um, we, we really have, as, as the chairs have said, we've come a long way since our first meeting uh, when the ANOPER was, was just a baby, although a, a very big baby at that. <laughs> um, now we do have two NOPERs in front of us. Uh, we've got long-term long uh, intra-regional planning and we've got GR reforms. And, and those are important, and I, and I think we most, mostly all support those. But I do want to remind the commission of my state's initial comments uh, on the ANOPER and request, uh, it, it was our request that you prioritize interregional transmission planning. And, and that wasn't just limited to the Kansas Corporation Commission. Um, the, the SPP Regional State Committee asked that that be a priority, and many other commenters uh, mentioned it as well. In the Kansas comments, uh, we emphasize that there are already robust and creative efforts on, ongoing in our RTOs to address long-term planning and GI backlog issues. Um, and, and it was our feeling that focusing on those items before or at the expense of interregional planning could be a missed opportunity for the commission. Um, there is overwhelming and continually growing body of evidence that materially expanding import and export capabilities among the regions will produce immense economic reliability and public policy benefits. And adding this extra transmission capacity to our grid will help solve the long-term planning and generator interconnection challenges that we face as well. But we need the commission to focus on this issue because from my perspective, it is the one area where a federal entity is uniquely suited to move us past the barriers of parochial interests, inconsistent planning methodologies, and the pricing challenges that thwart the free movement of clean and reliable and affordable power to customers who want it. Uh, those would be my opening comments and I very much look forward to the discussion on this issue. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Gladys Brown Dutrell from Pennsylvania. Very happy to be here again today. Uh, generally, I would just start out in terms of my comments of reminding everyone something you already know. We are a state that is one of the top exporters of, of electricity in terms of the megawatt hours, probably in the PJM region and 
probably across the country. Uh, so I emphasize that only because of, as I've always talked about, our diversity in terms of interest and things that we need to continue to talk about. So with the growth of renewable energy, we can expect to see changes in transmission flows and congestion patterns. And so for that reason, I think building uh, inner interregional transmission were proven to be needed and were proven to be more cost effective than a regional solution would alleviate some future uncertainty that we may have. I think we also uh, we need to be mindful of the need to plan the regional transmission system to first and foremost to be reliable and resilient and I think we continue to talk about that and where interregional transmission can support the regional reliability and resiliency in a cost effective manner that that's what makes sense to me if we dial down a little bit more in terms of more specifics uh, in terms of the question I, I think that looking at transfer capacity is an important issue and, a, and an opportunity for us uh, in my opinion the most important inter it's the most important interregional transmission opportunity and it may, it may be to increase um, the trans transfer capacity between the regions. But the barrier that I see to doing so is the lack of visibility regarding what transfer capacity exists. And I think that a solution to that barrier could be a comprehensive study uh, of what the existing transfer capacity is and underlying uh, under varying scenarios you know we talk about weather and wildfire and congestion and low growth so those are the type of things i think some some type of comprehensive study would be worthwhile in looking at the next step would be to study what kind of future transfer capacity will be necessary based on a diverse range of planning scenarios and and i see the need for two studies one for the present and one for the future but both studies should utilize a diverse set of planning scenarios. And I think that the national labs would be great in terms of being tasked to do these type of studies. Um, one of the things I do want to point out is that I'm not necessarily saying to um, build interregional capacity just for the sake of building it. One of the things I looked at a uh, comment in the ANOPER from uh, Dr. Patton and his comments support the premise that sometimes focusing on smaller regional projects will advance the transfer capacity between the regions. And I, I do want to just quote what he said. Many of the most beneficial transmission upgrades address very specific constraints. While large and costly new transmission facilities are sometimes the most cost effective transmission invest investments, smaller discrete projects to eliminate limiting elements are more often the most cost effective means to facilitate higher regional transfer capacity. So reliability and uh, ratepayer impact have to remain at the forefront of, of any of these changes. Thank you. The scripts, and I, I think as we go around, we should also um, maybe inject into the conversation of people are thinking when, of opportunities as uh, seams and transfer issues or a longer line um, to bring say renewables or other power across regions and just you may want to just comment on that as we go around yeah well thank you um and it tees up uh, at least one of the things i wanted to cover in my opening remarks i appreciate the prompt dr rob I am also very excited for this conversation. I think there's a real opportunity around interregional planning. Um, and Chair Glick, I particularly appreciate you raising the example of Winter Storm Uri, which I think remains front of mind for a lot of us, regardless of whether we were in the South or, or not during that time. Um, and I think one of the key takeaways on that is that, that really at the end of the day, this is a conversation about what is needed to support reliability and enhance resilience. There's no doubt that uh, increased in interregional um, transfers and interregional transmission can also offer uh, additional benefits, particularly economic uh, benefits. But, but ultimately, I think the real value is ensuring that we have a, a grid that can uh, support reliability and enhance resilience, particularly in times when the grid operates in ways other than for which it was originally planned. And we saw that in Winter Storm Uri as well, where some of those Pennsylvania exports, uh, instead of flowing further to the east, actually were coming across seams 
uh, to the West uh, into MISO and, and ultimately into SPP uh, as well. And as a seam state uh, that has both PJM and MISO inside of it and also has an international scene with the Ontario Independent Electricity System Operator that's uh, front of mind uh, for Michigan. Um, in terms of barriers, I think there are sort of barriers that uh, will undoubtedly be the part of the conversation today in terms of planning and cost allocation, and I don't want to, to overlook uh, those because I think they are important. But I, as importantly and maybe less well understood are some of the cultural and institutional barriers that exist between how RTOs and indeed between RTOs and non-RTO regions operate their systems. And it can be something as mundane as the timelines for the cost allocation process or the annual transmission planning process, but where those don't match up, uh, it creates yet another obstacle that needs to be overcome in evaluating whether there's benefit to interregional processes. And I think that's, that's something where those cultural issues, the timelines, the in, uh, internal processes and the institutional issues can be as important as anything else that gets maybe more attention in terms of planning and cost allocation. And then finally, I'd like to echo the, the comments from Chair French that FERC has a unique role to play here. Um, this is something that a number of us uh, have identified as being important in terms of interregional transmission, but it's also an issue that no individual state or indeed no in individual RTO can fix on their own. And we're going to need partnership and indeed leadership from the, from the FERC in order to, to make the progress that I think we agree is needed. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Danley. Nothing, thanks. <clears throat> Uh, Cliff Rechtschaff, and welcome to California, everybody, with the California Public Utilities Commission. Uh, I agree with what Chair Glick said and my colleagues about the importance of the interregional planning process, that it really hasn't worked, and there are very significant benefits in moving forward. Uh, I would cite as the two most important benefits, one, the ability to access low cost new renewable resources deliver this energy to load centers. This can yield very large cost savings, emission reductions. Uh, a recent MIT study about decarbon decarbonizing the US electricity system showed how much we could save in cost if we did that. I would note that in California, we, we are doing projects that cut across regions, they are being developed to deliver renewable resources, but to date they've been, they haven't been in a regional projects, they've been funded solely by California ratepayers. Uh, as Chair Glick and uh, Chair Scripps mentioned, there are a lot of reliability and resiliency benefits that come from allowing a region to access more diversified resources. I want to underscore the point that uh, Chair Scripps made that these are uh, increasingly important as a hedge against economic volatility, weather volatility, climate volatility, and every day in this summer, certainly we realize how important uh, that is. Chair Scripps mentioned cultural issues and timelines being a barrier. I would maybe go a little further and point out that a, a, a significant challenge is the way uh, grid operators in different regions and planning entities um, conduct planning and evaluate benefits. They do it in different ways and that makes it harder to come up with equitable and agreed upon cost allocation. So just to give you an example in the West, apart from the California ISO, other planning entities do not consider in their planning resource development beyond those that are already in the interconnection or underdeveloped, under development. That's that's very different than the portfolios that the CAISO builds into its cases. The CAISO uses an analysis for economic projects that considers a very broad range of benefits, such as the insurance value of transmission and other Western planning, planning entities don't. So that asymmetry makes it harder to come up with an agreed upon planning and cost allocation framework. And finally, and maybe this goes without saying, uh, but I think it's worth highlighting that the success of interregional planning will, and how effective it's gonna be, is gonna depend on how effective the underlying regional transmission processes are. So for example, in the West, apart from the CAISO, uh, no other planning entity has identified any 
digital transmission needs. So by definition, we can't really have a conversation about whether an interregional project could be selected that's better suited for meeting regional needs. So reforms to the regional planning process that FERC's undertaking will have a very definite benefit on the interregional planning process. Commissioner Dalfley. Uh, good morning. Before I begin my comments, I did want to say that I fully endorse what Chair Brown Dutrell just stated. And I think we have a lot of agreement around the table. Um, and like Chair Glick and Chair Scripps stated, I think the opportunity in this space presented itself with winter uh, storm Uri. And that opportunity is increasing transfer capacity between interested regions. Uh, the barriers to this opportunity I see are limited when we're talking about a future NOPR, uh, because I think that the infrastructure for these interested regions to coordinate with each other is already in place through Order 1000. So thus, it, it, it may just be a matter of these interested regions and interested RTOs truly engaging with each other and having hard discussions with each other and putting pen to paper, being put into a room, pen to paper, to determine what the benefits are, as well as the most economic way to increase the capacity in the areas of the country where it is needed. So there are some areas of the country that may need more interregional transmission through this increase of transfer capacity. However, and, and, and they may want this type of interregional transmission, where other areas of the country, like the Southeast, where through the IRP process, the generation is located close to load, may not need this type of interregional transmission, or they just may need less of this transfer capability. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. Thank you. I uh, also support the, uh, the comments of my, my colleagues. Um, I'm going to try not to uh, repeat uh, too much, but I might feature a couple aspects of what was said. I, I do believe, you know, just to start with, that there is kind of a, a, a growing uh, body of, of evidence that is, uh, you know, increasingly making the, the case that the interregional transmission uh, it can contribute uh, a, a, to a significant significant degree on I, I think of it in terms of the triad of, of needs that uh, this conference uh, this neighbor conference was started uh, uh, with where we were talking about affordability reliability and, and clean energy and I think those parallel the uh, the three dimensions of, of need that Chair French uh, spoke to that we, uh, often comes up in our conversations around uh, transmission, the efficiency, reliability, and, and uh, public power uh, aspects. Um, I uh, think the, the things that I wanted to kind of call out that are you know important to me are is the kind of efficiency of uh, the marketplace. I do believe that uh, there is uh, uh, some separation of uh, a value that is apparent in the markets that uh, you know fall along the seams, and they those can be addressed in part uh, through uh, the physical by removing some of the physical barriers associated with transmission. I think there were also some um, some clunkiness with uh, scheduling and, uh, and market design uh, issues that are also related. And I think what we need to have those in view as we think about this problem going forward. But uh, uh, there, there are indeed uh, seams. Those seams translate into uh, real impacts on the consumers. Uh, it, it really does relate to the affordability of, uh, of service. We have uh, plenty of studies out there that kind of call out the consumer savings that are uh, apparent. I won't uh, refer to specifically to those uh, studies, but I, I think they're, they're well in view and they are in the record in this uh, proceeding. In terms of barriers, I think, uh, uh, um, Commissioner uh, uh, Rechtafen and uh, others have referred to the timelines and schedules. I, I think there is uh, a barrier associated with leadership. I think the leadership comes from 
um, from all of us. And I think it also comes from uh, the regions and in different, uh, different places. But um, I think that's well spelled out in uh, some of the materials that are a part of this uh, proceeding. I think there are institutional barriers, uh, planning. I do believe that uh, when you're talking about regions, counting on the regions or the states to effectively uh, plan and coordinate uh, amongst themselves and between themselves is indeed uh, challenging. You really have to broaden that. You have to think in terms of either an interconnection wide, national, or uh, at least an interregional uh, framework for uh, essentially ad addressing the anticipatory planning that I, I feel is needed. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is just this, the, you know, the, the topic that we've been talking a lot about and we'll talk about later in this proceeding, which is the scope of benefits. Uh, we, we look at benefits too narrowly when we think about transmission, we plan for tran transmission. Thank you. Commissioner Christie. I don't know if it's not, but uh, first opportunities, I was reading an email right before we started this meeting from PJM came to all of us and it was giving PJM status for the last two days. And they hit a peak yesterday and they came close to hitting a peak uh, on Tuesday. What struck me about the status report from PJM is, in a, is not only did they hit a peak yesterday and come close on Tuesday, but they actually exported about six gigs uh, each day. And that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. And it illustrates two things. Uh, number one, it, the opportunity, there is a reliability and a resilience element to interregional transfers. I mean, if you can hit a peak and still export six gigs, uh, and Commissioner Dutrell knows a lot of it came from Pennsylvania, probably, uh, you're an exporting state. But uh, of course, uh, another point to that is you got to have the generation first before you can export it, right? And um, so, uh, opportunity though, interregional transfers do have uh, reliability benefits, no question about it. We saw that yesterday. Helped keep the lights on, probably in MISO, I'm assuming where most of it went. Um, Obstacles. Commissioner Scripps and Commissioner Duffley both illustrated a very important point. Uh, each region is different, and uh, the RTOs are different. They have different planning cycles. They have different criteria, uh, and then that's before you even get to the non-RTOs, like Commissioner Duffley is representing. So, uh, point there is whatever we do at FERC, and, I, and I've said before, I'd like to see us do something on interregional and and, and push the, the regions towards uh, interregional planning. Whatever we do in pushing the regions towards interregional planning, it has to recognize the differences between the RTOs and the non, uh, RTOs themselves, as well as, uh, as non-RTO regions, and let those regional differences uh, reflect themselves and be part of that part of that effort. That's all I got, Mr. Chairman. Chair Thomas. Thank you, Dr. Rob. First, in terms of definition of seams, as you as you referenced. Uh, for my region, I look at it as more seams issues than the big scale, uh, huge long line from Denver to Cincinnati. Uh, to me, in our region, that is such a large and difficult undertaking that could it, it would probably only happen as a result of federal policy and federal funding, and I don't see the administration as yet committed to that approach. So I focus on seams in terms of opportunities. The first opportunity is what we're doing in terms of synthesizing the planning and the interconnection process through JTIQ. Now we're on the early innings of that. Uh, that's an opportunity that needs to be followed through and developed. It's not already done, uh, but it's a, a great opportunity uh, in my view. And there's some other stuff that's happening that I don't want to, you know, touch to give people a reason to freak out. But it also has a, a potential along those lines that, that MISO and SPP are working well together in this effort, but it's the early innings. Second opportunity is uh, Chair Dutrell mentioned as well as uh, Mr. Duffley and Riley, the, the, the study of the, of the inter-regional transfer uh, to me, the no-brainer is the studying and baselining. The brainer, as opposed to the no-brainer, is the difficult jurisdictional issue where we don't want to have so much flexibility that nothing happens, but we don't want either a one-size-fits-all mandate. 
a balancing of that issue is a challenge. To me, the chief barrier are the barriers that are inherent in a voluntary RTO system where stakeholders develop their rules and as stakeholders in two separate regions develop different rules, it creates seams issues. As uh, Commissioner Fleur once humorously pointed out, um, but at the same time, there needs to be standardization of time frames and modeling. And there's FERC precedent for that. There's a NIPSCO, Northern Indiana Public Service case, where there was some standardization directed between MISO and PJM in terms of the transmission planning time frames. And the, um, the, I, I don't know if they address modeling, but the modeling is a challenge. It's, it's hard to do the planning when the planners bring two different models to the table. So some standardization is one of the barriers. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Clements. Thank you, Dr. Robb, and thanks to everyone for hanging in there for this conversation at the end of a long week. Um, it's encouraging to hear the shared interest across what Commissioner Christie described as a really, you know, importantly diverse set of states in this issue of interregional transfer capability. And I think some of the barriers we've experienced as a country, and I think this is a shared barrier across the region, regardless of, of where you, you sit in a country, is the um, lack of results we've experienced through the interregional coordination provisions of Order 1000. And I think it's important to hone in on that uh, barrier for a moment to help inform the opportunity and the implementation of the opportunity around whatever the right amount of interregional transfer capability between any two particular regions might be. You know, in the Order 1000 structure, as you all know, you've got this idea that you do a, you have a local planning project, which then might be replaced or deferred by a more cost-effective regional project, which then might be replaced or deferred by a more cost-effective or efficient inter-regional process. That's a lot of overlapping processes that make it difficult to break through to yes, and we haven't seen any inter-real uh, meaningful inter-regional projects come from those provisions. So coordination doesn't work is there a way the opportunity to me is seeing this shared interest in uh, transfer capability as critical to reliability that we could um, propose actual joint planning under a more limited set of circumstances you're not saying just writ large interregional planning which to get to your point chair thomas um, maybe require a different approach but to provide an opportunity to do one planning, uh, one, one type of planning that allows for both regions involved or whichever regions are involved to come together on a cost allocation mechanism that doesn't require then, you know, separate approval processes through different regions, therefore to kind of get around what we call the triple hurdle problem uh, in this more limited set of circumstances. And I think that's a real opportunity relative to this, to this uh, shared interest. Thanks. Chair LaVar. Thank you. I just want to say it's an exciting time to be part of the electricity space in the Western United States. There's a lot happening in the West and a lot of successes and a lot of opportunities. And I appreciate the chance to be part of this task force to, to talk about those. Um, I, I can't stop thinking about a comment I heard in a panel yesterday, and I'm not going to say whether I agree with this comment, but a, a commenter expressed the opinion that the um, track one NOPER included a finding that the non RTO areas are not complying with order 1000. And I, I thought about that in context of all that's happening in the West and, 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 and all the exciting things that are happening. And, and I just want to want to highlight that um, everyone knows the market development things that are happening and, and all the significant efforts that are going on to that. But when we talk about regional and interregional transmission planning, we all want to think about the Western interconnection as one entity, but there are multiple transmission plan, planning entities. Obviously, there's the California ISO. There's, you know, Northern Grid and West Connect that are planning regions. And there are developments that might in the near future have the Southwest Power Pool doing transmission planning for part of the Western interconnection. But we still have one interconnection that we that we like to think about and talk about in that way and that functions in, in some ways. We, we've had some successes on increasing the footprint and increasing the way that we're doing transmission planning in that scenario. One recent success story is the consolidation of Columbia Grid and Northern Tier Transmission Group into Northern Grid. This was a significant positive development that moved forward the opportunity to increase the footprint of regional transmission planning. 
Another opportunity we have is with the Western Electricity Coordinating Council. Because of the non-RTO non nature of most of the West, um, the WEC serves a different function than I think most of the NERC regional entities do in RTO areas. They develop anchor data sets that are populated by the integrated resource plans of the utilities. And those anchor data sets are heavily relied upon in, by the transmission planning that Northern Grid and West Connect does. WEC is currently engaging in a process to, to make its modeling much more robust. They're expending significant resources and engaging in a significant stakeholder process to make that modeling more useful and more uh, dynamic. And so that's another exciting thing. So I, at the beginning of this meeting, I just wanna say stakeholders in the West aren't sitting on our hands. We have a lot of exciting things happening. We're all working actively to improve both regional and interregional planning. There are a lot of opportunities on the horizon. Obviously, some of those opportunities are limited by different transmission seams that currently exist as different utilities are looking at possibilities with the California ISO versus the Southwest Power Pool and existing transmission affect the, the potential for those. But I just want to say the West is a success story that is continuing to evolve. And across most of the states in the West, reliability and affordability are both excellent. And we hope to anything that we do improves that and makes things better. And we're excited to be part of the conversations to continue moving forward. Thank you. Commissioner Phillips. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm in violent agreement with so many of my colleagues around the table. <laughs> and so I won't repeat many of the comments we've already heard. I will remark upon the MIT study that my colleague from California raised. And I saw that same study. And you think about how important the clean energy transition is and how important storage is to the long-term success of, of that question. The MIT study found that the economic benefit of more transmission is even greater than storage. Think about that. You know, another point I'll, I'll make, if, if, if all you care about is cost savings, and I submit to you, money has its place, SPP found that for every dollar of transmission expansion, they get $3.50 of benefits back to the grid. Now, there are more important things. You've all heard me talk about reliability. I see this problem through that prism as well. And I'll talk about that some more in a moment. But that's all I have to say right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to Chair Gleck, I'm gonna go to uh, Chair Nelson from Massachusetts. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there. I think uh, Cliff and I aren't allowed in the same room together, so I apologize. <laughs> um, well, the benefit of going last is I get to hear all the good comments before me, and I'm in agreement with, with many of them. You know, I think we've heard a lot about the economic benefit that can come from interregional transmission, uh, from exporting that Commissioner Christie talked about to uh, the payback um, period that you can see. Uh, I think that we heard about the reliability benefits as well, uh, and, and uh, Chair Glick commented on that, on that just in the ERCOT region. You know, if we believe the basic economic principles, right, removing barriers and adding infrastructure and allowing the power to, uh, the power to flow uh, from different regions, I think we're going to see a clear net benefit to consumers, and, and I think that needs to be underscored. So, you know, it's critical that if we agree that a better interregional planning model can exist and we can effectively expand that geographical footprint for states, um, I think we have an obligation to do that, whether it's for an economic region, uh, economic reasons for consumers that are becoming ever more present, or whether it's for state clean energy goals. I think that uh, projects that are uh, looked at that way uh, can have a high value um, to regions. And I speak from that, uh, from uh, a ISO New England, which is unlikely to be the recipient of many interregional projects. Um, and I will say a critical barrier here, and Commissioner Clements kind of highlighted that, is I do think that both the states and FERC need to think about um, what we might unintentionally set up as we start to develop our uh, regional planning standards. So state agreements, regional specific ben uh, benefit categories, not 
the value of the benefits, I think those should be specific regions, but the actual categories could limit the ability for us to take advantage of some interregional planning. If states don't have the same foundational categories of benefits when they're planning, it's going to be very difficult for regions to compare with each other. Um, this could limit planning and ability to be, uh, build those much needed lines. So I, I think this is something that we and FERC needs to keep in mind um, as we develop um, you know, regions inside of RTOs and even non-RTO areas, uh, because we want uh, to make sure that we're developing something that will be compatible, not only in given regions, but across different regions. And it may fall to FERC um, to kind of be the entity that interprets and settles some of those interregional disputes, not the local RTOs. So uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to participate, FERC. Thank you. So um, chance for either a, or both of the co-chairs if you want to weigh in on this question on opportunities and barriers before we, uh, we discuss it further. Yeah, I'll, I'll be very quick because I, I, I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but around the table, a couple of things that I thought was worth noting, one of which I think there's significant support for doing something, uh, doing more on interregional transmission, which I think I find very gratifying. But I do think that there, there's, there's this issue about, and, and we often approach these issues by saying we need to, each region's different and we need to give deference to the regions. And I, and we often do that at FERC. We spend a lot of time thinking about that and doing that. I think this is an area um, where we need to break down those those barriers, and that, that I think they are sometimes by uh, addressing differences or, or permitting differences, sometimes that creates barriers to interregional development. So we need to think think about that as well. Thank you. Um, batting cleanup here, I I was thinking that regional transmission development and interregional transmission development they share a lot of the same, if not identical, challenges and opportunities as well, but they, they serve a very different purpose. Uh, I had a good conversation with the chief engineer at the PSC before I came out here. And he emphasized the fact, and I believe it's true, that inter-regional transmission plays a very different role than regional transmission, such as in the interstate example that we've heard before. You don't typically drive on the interstate to pick up a gallon of milk. Uh, same thing, if you go on a, a cross-country road trip, you're not gonna be taking uh, local roles, roads uh, to your destination. So th this type of transmission, very two very different functions, uh, very different benefits flow, flow out of this. And unfortunately, we haven't seen a tremendous amount of um, coordination by the training, um, uh, transmission planning authorities, as well as the, the RTOs. And there, there are some, some exceptions, but the, the promise of what Border 1000 held out back 11 years ago has failed to result in any meaningful uh, public policy transmission projects. I'm not sure if there's even, even one to show for it in the intervening time. So it shows you that, that we do have some challenges. I, I believe the track one NOPR um, goes a long way to addressing uh, some of those unfulfilled promises. In the mid-Atlantic, I think a, a very good example is with respect to offshore wind. States from New England, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, and North Carolina all have tremendous um, ambitions to develop offshore wind. And we, we have to recognize, I don't think I said Virginia, but Virginia is on that list as well. Um, the fact that we have to coordinate whatever type of collector system, uh, and it's going to be an interregional system to bring that wind on shore. And what we've seen so far is, is New Jersey, who's been a, a, a leader here, um, and a number of their commissioners have been in attendance this week. This is a costly endeavor. And as I look at it currently, they are going it alone. They've elected to take advantage of the state agreement approach and pay for that transmission as, as it's uh, developed. Those costs won't be socialized. That is not the way for us to be developing transmission along the East Coast. Um, when you have Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey only sharing a border, they're a few miles apart from each other, but you have three RTOs, ISO New England, NISO, and PJM that are responsible. We have to have clear, open communication coordination between the RTOs and what is contained in Order 1000 currently is not doing that, it's failing to deliver. So 
Um, I agree with almost everything I've heard uh, today. I'm not sure if it's violent agreement, but it's, it's solid <laughs> agreement. Um, and looking forward to the balance of, of today's conversation. Well, thank you, everybody, for, I think, getting us off to, uh, to a good start. And I want to I'm going to spend a little bit more time on the barriers because I think that's going to set us up for the solutions. But before I did that, I wanted to just have a little bit more of discussion about the opportunities and just play back what I think I heard and then just let you all comment and build on that. So what I heard as we went around the table was almost everyone mentioned the importance of reliability and resilience and trying to a major opportunity is around transfer capability and, and dealing with the seams. Some of you said that those projects will, um, will could also, I think um, Chair Scripps said it most succinctly, could also have corollary economic, significant economic benefits, but the main focus is still on reliability and resilience. A few of you, ending um, with Chair Stanek, were saying that also, um, we should, when we're thinking about interregional, we should be thinking about um, public policy. Um, that's not necessarily maybe reliability and resilience driven, but public policy driven. And I think Chair French and Commissioner Rushoffen were also talking about those types of projects, which often have to do with moving renewables onshore or across large distances. But I didn't get a sense that I heard that from a lot of you. So why don't we just talk about that? Is there a consensus that everybody's agreeing we, we definitely need to do something about major and biggest opportunity is around seams and reliability and resilience and the other, other um, more public policy or even economic benefits are more secondary. So I'll just share French. I guess I'll go first. I'll be I'll be very brief. I I think um, I I actually agree that the first way uh, to look at benefits is is resilience. I mean, this became on our radar as a result of Winter Storm Uri and the fact that. Um, you know, Kansas probably looks at cost allocation of these types of projects differently than it would have a few years ago. Um, we see real benefits. Um, a, a few large service interruptions, um, even what we had in SPP for a few hours, um, you have several of those and they will pay for lines very quickly. But even though that is the case, I think even though that is the main benefit, I think it's a missed opportunity if these lines are only um, set up to provide import export during extreme events. If you're gonna build this infrastructure, I think we have to tackle some of the challenges that other people raised um, of maybe market constructs that don't work well together. Um, is there, are there congestion constraints that prevent flows um, between the regions? Um, I, there are other pricing challenges. I guess where, I, where I'm going is if we're going to make this investment and we want to get the benefits of resilience, we should also make sure that transactions can happen across these lines at, at other times of the year, because that's how you're going to get the full economic benefits, but it's also how you're going to fulfill um, various state and regions uh, public policy goals, making sure that they can utilize that import and export capability at all times of the year. Chair Scripps. I, as usual, agree with everything my colleague from the Mid-American region <laughs> said. Um, but I, just to, to quantify, I, I, first of all, I don't think that you can disaggregate the economic benefits and some of the other uh, tangible and measurable benefits from the uh, reliability and resilience benefits. But I also don't want to lose sight, sorry, of the fact that the I think the the real driving concern behind a lot of this is reliability and resilience. But just to put a couple of numbers to those, um, at the OMS Spring Seminar in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, we got a, an, uh, a review, and I think we actually got this for the, the um, NARUF members of the task force as well, and um, some work that uh, ESIC has done, uh, linking up different regions. And the way they ran their model uh, was to take two regions, both of which um, in the model were on the wrong side of the NERC planning parameters, uh, the one day and 10. And I think that's been something um, we've seen it in MISO, um, certainly, and I, I know that it's front of mind for a lot of others and some of the NERC concerns that have been raised as well. 
but you could take two deficient regions, linking them with, uh, with a transmission interconnect, and all of a sudden both regions, without the addition of additional generation, uh, go back to the right side of the, the NERC planning parameters. I, and I think, to your point earlier that you flagged in terms of whether this is seams or long line connections, I think it can be both. In that instance, I think it was a long line connection. These were not regions that shared a seam in, in the model, but, but I think you could do either. But it's, I think that's sort of the resilience tie-in that, that is difficult to measure. And in fact, I agree with Chair French that when you try and measure it in terms of value of lost load or any other metric, when you load that up with the impact, even a tiny, tiny disruption pays for itself very, very quickly. And so it, trying to do this from a, a traditional cost benefit analysis, um, I, I think it's important that we go through the, the process to make sure that these are indeed valuable projects. But often what you find is the, the, the consequences are so catastrophic that, um, that, it, that it becomes fairly easy to justify. And then finally, on the economic benefits, just not to leave that off, we also, as, as the group of neighbor commissioners participating, were briefed on a forthcoming GE study that saw $3 billion in uh, production cost savings as a result of greater interconnection um, and it, from an interregional perspective. And so I, those are you know, real dollars, real numbers, and I don't want those to get lost, but I, I don't think you can separate the resilience reliability benefits from the economic benefits. They, they come together, um, and otherwise I agree with everything that Chair Frank said. Commissioner Allen and then Commissioner Duff. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I'm probably going to overlap with with my colleagues uh, as usual, but um, and you know uh, reliability, of course, you know that that stands out. It's uh, it's critically important, and I think it's well in in view right right now. But I want to be clear that that my my view is uh, is really uh, pooling all the categories of need and benefit together. I think it's uh, the public policy should be shoulder to shoulder with economic and with uh, reliability as we evaluate uh, needs going forward. It's, uh, I feel that about in-region projects, but I also feel that uh, strongly about uh, the inter-regional opportunities. And uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, the, the holistic anticipatory planning that I think is uh, needed is, is broad. Thanks. Sure, Paul. So my, my comment when I was hearing about the different types of changes, I heard the word standard market design, and I also heard a suggestion of um, a top down type planning where you would remove approval processes within the region versus the bottom up way that we currently do it. And I think that the CROOK states obviously were different than RTOs and would oppose that type of change. And I'd just like to give an example um, that, for example, um, RTOs measure uh, market efficiency benefits based on an LMP, where a Duke Energy in North Carolina does not use LMPs. And so you have two different types of benefit metrics. And so a bottom up approach allows for these regional differences and allows for these different benefit metrics and the calculation. But the top-down planning would conflict with regions such as ours that do not have that same uh, benefit metric. And so that's one comment I would like to make to the group when we're discussing potential changes. Chair Stanek. Uh, Commissioner Allen mentioned this a moment ago in terms of reliability, but we're, we're seeing an increase, just a statistical increase in the number of emergency conditions, whether it be blamed on extreme weather as we're experiencing this week, but like we've never seen before in our, our nation's history. Uh, obviously, inter-regional connections could improve that. We've already heard, and I, I suspect we'll hear more about the winter storm URI example, only four days long, but it, it wreaked havoc from, from Texas all the way up to, to Minnesota cost probably over a billion dollars in price separation. Lives were lost. Uh, people were out of power for, for four days. And that transmission, um, additional new transmission, would have bought and paid for itself in the, in the time that, um, that, that, frankly, was a disaster. That happened last year. And hopefully, we don't see that again. Uh, but with uh, the FERC State of the Markets report that we, uh, or the summer assessment that we saw earlier, predictions of potential brownouts and blackouts in um, both Texas and California, 
this year, knock on wood. Um, can't lose sight of the fact that economics are important, but reliability, resilience, extreme operating conditions, I think this all factors into this, this discussion today. Um, it goes back to the needs for the planning regions and for the RTOs to go above and beyond the minimum requirements of coordination in, in Order 1000 and whether it takes the federal government through FERC to step in, because as my initial colleague stated, we just can't do this on the, on the state level. We cannot force the planning regions to adopt the minimum transfer capability. Uh, we can't require that they invest in, in new equipment on, on both sides of the, the scene. And in the, in the macro region, uh, predominantly overlaid by, by PGM, we, we keep a close eye on the communications between the Western neighbors and MISO, as well as the Northern neighbor in, in New York. And to be quite honest, I'm not sure that there's a lot happening interregionally between New York and, and PGM at the moment. Uh, more likely needs to be done and hopefully more is being done even in advance of any directives of, uh, of FERC. Does so anybody else want to add anything on the opportunities before we talk a little bit more about the barriers? I'm, I feel like I'm holding the reins on uh, uh, stallions that want to get to the solutions quickly. So we'll get there, I promise. But anything, anything else on the opportunities? Okay, um, so on the barriers, um, I think we heard going around the room a lot, a lot of the similar things we were hearing uh, on some of the regional issues about timelines, about lists of benefits, but probably more severe when now you're doing interregional planning between regions. And if the regions are using very different timelines, very different sets of benefits, different methodologies, um, it's a little harder to kind of come, come together. Um, on, so how do we, how do we balance that with also um, wanting, which we've heard, um, that we want regions to have a certain amount of autonomy um, and states have autonomy in, in deciding which benefits are the most important. So we're, we're kind of trying to, what, what, what are the most important barriers here, I guess is where I'm headed that need to be similar what might need to be similar in order to, for interregional projects to move forward? What are the most important barriers? Is it timeline? Is it the list of benefits? What, what are those barriers? We also heard about small, having very small regions um, being a barrier. Um, what are the things that we're gonna, in a moment, turn to to try and fix um, in terms of those barriers? And what is it okay if things are different between the regions? Yep, uh, Chair Thomas. In the NIPSCO case, um, they, they overlaid the two regional timelines and there was a very brief period of time where the, the planning processes were live where they could have done a joint plan. And, and that's easy to fix, but when it's not fixed, it's a headshot. If you have three weeks to figure out something that we struggled, as Chair Stanek pointed out, to figure out over 11 years, and you have a three week window where you can do joint planning for the same planning cycle, it's a headshot. But that one's fairly easy to fix. That's standardization. Does it matter if we drive on the right side of the road or the left side, as long as everybody knows? which side uh, that it is. One thing I would note on the benefits, that's a contentious issue, but if you take the just the traditional benefits, the ones we all agree on, and put a percentage on them, that's a pretty high percentage. We're, we're squeezing at the edge on the margin, and I think we should do that if we can rigorously establish the quantification of the benefits, but there isn't a silver bullet on benefits when, when 85 or 90% of the stuff is, is already on the table. I think we should try to squeeze that extra 10% out, uh, but I don't see that as a world changer. And then the modeling is always a problem. To get people on the same page, the modeling has to be the same. Folks are used to their models, they like their models, and it's a heavy lift to get them to change that. I don't know if you could do an additional a triple hurdle, triple model, where you have another model that they both do so they can stay with their others. The modeling is just a practical reality challenge that's hard to overcome. 
Thank you. So even if you have similar benefits, if they're modeled and there are different assumptions, yes. our compatibility it's, it's, to it's make it work. It's not enough just to have a yeah. benefit in name. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you have two measurements uh, and you're trying to put them together, if the models are different, it's hard to put the two measurements. Commissioner Allen. Um, so I'll just try to uh, stick to one point that I want to make at, at this point juncture, uh, which is, I, I think it's, it's really comes down to placing responsibility with institutions that are essentially equipped for the task or uh, have the, uh, the scope of responsibility to create a plan or a vision that can actually then be ultimately uh, ground truth by the, um, the, the planning bodies within the regions or within the states. So uh, it's, it's creating that inter-regional plan, if, if you will, uh, even if it's at a high level that can then be acted upon by the uh, institutions that are ultimately responsible for um, uh, implementing those plans. Chair, Chair, Chair Skonik and Chair Scripps, then Chair LeVar. Uh, two, two barriers really quickly. Um, one, I want to recognize that we have the task force docket and a small number of parties uh, actually took the opportunity to, to file. Uh, including New Jersey BPU, so I appreciate that. Orsted made a, a very good point, whether or not our planning regions and RTOs are sufficiently staffed to handle all of the engineering, all the planning. They're obviously very busy right now doing the regional planning. That do they have the additional staff to, to look one step further and conduct inter-regional uh, planning? And the second point I'd just like to highlight, as Chair Thomas mentioned a, a second ago, we have lots of different projects. We have reliability, public policy, economic, MVP, and the RTOs simply cannot mix and match. A PGM economic project and a MISO reliability project cannot be reviewed together. It's either like-like um, or the project doesn't go forward. Of course, my public policy project in, in Maryland may be Pennsylvania's reliability project, and that just might be the, as plain as day. But if the RTOs across seams cannot model an identical project that is being designed to suit different needs of particularly different states or different regions, then we have a, a major problem. I don't think it's one that could be, um, uh, it's insurmountable, but I think it's something that needs to be focused on. I mentioned cost allocation just in passing in my opening remarks, um, sort of half expecting that it might get picked up by others, um, but but it didn't, so I'm gonna come back to it. I, I don't think it's, dip, it's possible to overstate the importance of, of getting cost allocation right and often on the front end. Um, and what we've seen in the MISO planning processes, for example, is it at a minimum, like with the JTIQ process that Chair Thomas was describing, needs to go hand in hand. And, and often there needs to be agreement on cost allocation approaches uh, or a, a, a process set out that's sort of well in motion before really the nuts and bolts of the engineering can go forward or else I, I think what we've seen is that um, there are always objections that can be raised in the engineering and often those in my view are sort of drive from concern over how the cost of that project that's being reviewed ultimately be allocated among among the payees. So that piece to, to some extent what Chair Thomas was talking about on processes and things there's a, a path forward and it, it takes some some work to, to get there but cost allocation is just inherently complicated difficult and contentious and I, I don't want to sort of go through this without flagging that as the barrier that it is so, so just improving the planning coordination alone isn't enough if we don't figure out the cost allocation piece as well chair lavar I'm probably being repetitive and stating the obvious, but you know, I, I don't know of any regulators in the West who aren't willing to pay for reliability and resilience. It's all crucial. Um, we, we see the importance of it and, and economic benefits are obvious. We, we don't mind in Utah getting all those duck curve, um, cheap uh, solar megawatt hours from California during those hours that saves us a lot in fuel costs. But at the, you know, the risk of stating the obvious, the, the, one, the, one of the challenges and one of the barriers to the, to the final steps that many stakeholders want to take in the Western United States is the fact that generation decisions drive the transmission needs and, and, and how the lines connect between the generation decisions that are separate from the transmission planning 
and how that works in is is a challenge that we haven't solved and 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 in, not just in transmission planning but in lots of areas and in, in, in utilities that serve multiple states those generation decisions are driving a lot of a lot of stressors and so how to recognize those impacts is is difficult but i think everyone in the west is is engaging actively to try to find ways to move forward but i don't think we have a solution to that i was i wasn't sure if we had time but i since nobody else has has really fundamentally raised this barrier i guess I, i'm going to throw it out there without a solution <laughs> but um I see that the title is also includes transmission project development, and I think we're ignoring a big piece if we don't talk about state siting um, and state certification processes. Uh, you know, fundamentally at root, what we're talking about within a regional is not just the seams projects, but it is also moving remote resources to far away load centers that are demanding um, the resources, and you have a challenge often of states in between that that may not see a benefit or may have a different view of the benefit and i i think that's something we really need to tackle i mean my, my fellow fellow task members are getting tired of hearing me say this but you know, my position is the ideal scenario would be that you would cite new load where the resource is and that's still <laughs> and and you and you don't build transmission i'm sorry i know we're the transmission task force but um and and so you know i would love to see some initiative on that from from doe uh, or FERC if they thought they had a role but ultimately you know the load centers exist where they exist the labor pools uh exist where they exist and that's the area that is going to demand energy and that's not the area that has the resource that they want and so being able to move across regions um, and to maybe find benefits for those areas in between i, I think is going to be crucial and i i haven't heard a great <laughs> solution yet but i think it's something that you know we're sticking our head in the sand if we don't talk about it Chair Thomas, and then we're going to move Thank on. You, Dr. Well, while I agree with Commissioner French on the end goal, I see that as run in a crawl, walk, run world. <laughs> if we could do this, if we could do that, this other stuff we were talking about would be easy when we know that it's not. I think we probably have to do the easier stuff in hopes that that leads to, his, to that. I think that's the right outcome, these larger scale transactions. But there's a lot of little stuff that's also barriers to that that need to be solved uh, in, in order. Thank you. Great. Okay. So as that is our warm up exercise, now we're going to um, turn to what you all would recommend needs to be done um, to essentially um, overcome the barriers and capture the opportunities, and. We're asking, um, so we're focusing on planning, coordination, cost allocation, and anything else that you also uh, want to throw into this bucket. But how do we improve the way we plan, coordinate, allocate costs to better capture interregional transmission opportunities? And I think we we obviously want to keep in mind the discussions the task force already had on these topics in. Uh, in DC, as well as the NOPR that came out um, after there. And so, so kind of what is, what's transferable from what we're talking about in the region to the interregional framework, what has to be unique and, and, and different and suited to an interregional um, effort. And so we're gonna, um, as I, I mentioned, what we'll do is for here, um, we're gonna hear from one state commissioner from each of the five regions and uh, and two for commissioners just to kind of get the ball rolling and then we'll uh, open it up for a conversation so the the order will be um michigan chair scripps first then north carolina commissioner duffley next then from for commissioner phillips um vermont commissioner allen pennsylvania chair Brown Dutrell, and then uh, for Commissioner Clements, and then Commissioner Rechshoffen will 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 back clean up, and then we'll open it up for full full discussion. So let's hear it. What are your what are your thoughts? 
I feel like I'm using up all my words in the first third of the meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just keep going. Um, so first of all, as has been noted by Chair Glick and uh, Commissioner Clements and, and others, I, I think we do have an issue here that we have not seen uh, the level of interregional transmission build out that I think was anticipated uh, in Order 1000. I don't know that that's dispositive on its own. Um, there could be other reasons that, that maybe by the time you get to the third piece of the planning, you've done all of the other work. But I think at a minimum, it is an issue that is worthy of inquiry on whether we can do better. And I, I believe ultimately that, that we'll find that we can. In terms of how that approach should work, I agree with uh, Commissioner Duffley in terms of that it, it starts with information sharing. And I think that was teed up in the, the NOPER and I think it's, it's a great place to start and builds uh, elegantly, I think, on the, the language of Order 1000 uh, around coordination and study. Um, but I don't also believe that we can stop there. And so I, I would support, I think, a presumptive minimum level of transfer capability uh, that's been discussed as well uh, in terms of um, articulating some level that is expected uh, that where power can move between the regions in order to uh, in enhance the resilience of the overall system. And I think that FERC has an important and indeed unique role here in setting that. I'm not sure whether it needs to be a number in terms of setting a, a presumptive number, 10%, 20%, whatever that is, and saying that we believe this is what's possible and at this level of, of transfer, we're going to see a more resilient system overall and then provide regions flexibility to say, mm, between our two regions, we actually think that there's a different level and or whether it's a set of criteria or a methodology to um, sort of, um, provide sort of the platform on which the regions can sort of discuss and figure that out between themselves. But I do think some set of minimum expectations um, as a presumptive ish, um, floor is, is going to be important in, in terms of actually moving from the zero that we have today just to something more that can enhance the, the resilience of the system. I would add to that that um, it will be important in crafting that to recognize what's already taking place. Um, the flexibility is going to be important, but also needing to avoid interrupting ongoing work, including the intra-regional work that's happening in a number of RTOs, that adding another uh, inter-regional piece on this, if it's done sort of in isolation or without the appropriate context of what's already taking place, I'm, I have some concerns that it could um, inadvertently press a pause button on some of the important work that's taking place uh, as we sort of study not only what's happening within the region, but what needs to happen then between the regions. And then I finally would close that, that some of this is absolutely around planning and cost allocation and some of the process and um, institutional improvements, but some of it is also uh, simply coordination of operations. And you've seen, I think, different levels of this. I think when push came to shove during Winter Storm Yuri, you actually saw from an operational standpoint, PJM and MISO and SPP working really well together. The markets don't work the way that they, they need to, to Chair French's point. Uh, but from an operational perspective, um, it, it worked. But Chair Thomas raised this in some of our internal conversations in the lead up, that this may actually be the low hanging fruit between particularly RTO regions and non-RTO regions, but some sort of baseline of expectations on how the two regions uh, would interface or two operating systems would interface from an operational standpoint, I think can yield some more immediate results uh, while we continue to push for, for a more holistic approach to planning. Um, so what we've heard several people state today is we've been discussing all of these issues in our prior three meetings. I think the difference between regional uh, transmission planning and cost allocation and interregional planning and cost allocation really is you're making it more complex, right? You have more entities involved and the regional differences actually increase. And when I say regional differences, I mean market structures, natural resources, job development, just the geography of the different regions, to name a few. Um, the way that we capture the interregional opportunities is to hold on to the themes that we've heard and which we've discussed at the three prior ses sessions, and that is regional differences exist. 
and a one-size-fits-all approach is not an appropriate way to incent new transmission. In recognizing that there needs to be flexibility and focusing on and targeting regions interested in pursuing interregional opportunities may actually result in the desired in outcome. By assisting these interested regions in maintaining consistent dialogue upfront may result in the most efficient and economic build out of the system while avoiding overbuilding the system in regions where it may not be needed. And um, I was in a, on a panel yesterday and we were talking about uh, regional transmission planning and someone stated that, uh, that the Southeast or SIRTAP was failing in their order 1000 requirements because there is no regional transmission. And I did counter that I defended the Southeast and stated you, can, you can't say just because a line hasn't been built is a reason that you need to, to change the framework. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Phillips. Thank you. Um, you know, it's funny. I've been talking to a lot of people about this issue throughout the conference. And I'm reminded of a comment I, I heard this morning. I asked a gentleman, wise man in the hallway. I said, you know, I'm going to be talking about this issue today. What should I say? And he said, you know, much has been said about the issue of interregional planning. We just all haven't had a chance to say it yet. So with that in mind, I'll be very careful to stick to, I want to report back to you on the things that I've heard this week. All right. You know, first of all, I had a conversation with a gentleman from MISO, and you talk about coordination and planning. I and mean, he told me more in 10 minutes about coordination and I've really learned in the past several months trying to research this issue. So the thing I learned from this gentleman is that there are people in regions that know how to do coordination. Another gentleman I talked to, he said, you know, this, this triple hurdle issue that we have, you know, people are, the way we do it is that we look at our neighbor and we say, okay, well, you look at what your needs are. You analyze those needs over there. And I'm gonna analyze my needs. And then you select the projects that you think are most important for interregional, and I'll select the projects and the benefits that I think are most important for interregional. Then we'll put them together, and we'll do an inter interregional planning process together. But when you start talking about benefits, if any of those benefits don't properly align, then those projects fall out. And what do we do? We wash, rinse, repeat, and things don't get built. Um, but people are doing what I believe in large part what order number 1000 told them to do. They're checking the box on coordination. You know, our friends from California, our hosts, you know, they'll tell you that they have projects. I believe they'll tell you, I don't want to speak for you, <laughs> but they'll tell you they, they have interregional projects that they value for state, you know, greenhouse gas goals, right? But then you look at other states in the West who may not have those same goals. And so they don't necessarily value those projects. But I'm told again and again, everybody I talk to, we all value reliability. We all value resist, re resiliency. But how do, you, how do you quantify? So I spoke with some folks from the labs and they told me that they're doing studies right now. They're trying to wrap their mind around the value of reliability, around resilience. But here's what we know. We know that it's not zero. Talk to other people, folks at AEP, they'll tell you, you know, part of this issue is timing, right? You have so much planning going on and you have local planning, you have regional planning, and then you, then you have that little interregional thing I just talked about a little bit, and it's all happening at different times. Now, one thing that we can do, I've heard, is try to harmonize those processes. And some people say, we should do this like every three years. Some people say two, some people say four. Cost allocation. You know, I'm very interested, just like we talked about with regional transmission planning, having the states involved early in the process and at the table. You know, I'm curious about a state agreement approach. I know that SPP has a state collaboration uh, process where they bring people together. And, and I've heard some success stories there. Um, the one thing I've heard the most though, is that the question is why we don't have projects that are being built it's because we don't have a requirement for a minimum level of transfer capacity. 
But we all know we need it. I don't have to talk about Winter Storm Uri again. Kind of got in trouble talking about that before. Um, but I'll say this. This is Willie talking. We have these imaginary boundaries that we've set up. And they're real. But when you think about extreme weather, wildfires, they don't respect your boundaries. When you think about the heat that we're having right now on the East Coast, don't care. Cold weather, hurricanes on the East Coast and South, these events don't care about our boundaries. And so what we're doing now by not having a minimum, I believe, is that we're just crossing our fingers and hoping that nothing terrible happens again. And even if you have people say that, you know, there are regions that know how to do this. I've gone down to some of these places. I've talked to the regional operators and, and they tell me the horroring stories that happen when they're actually trying to make this work real time. We can do better. Somebody told me one time, if you know better, you can do better. Um, at the end, this all comes down to, for me, reliability and reliability is about risk. So I think we all need to ask ourselves, what is our risk tolerance? What are we willing to take? Are you willing to risk reliability? Are you willing to risk public safe, safety? Are you willing to risk cost savings that we all talked about? Choose wisely. Thank you. Mr. Allen. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Start by uh, saying that I, at a very high level, I, I think we need to shift from, you know, essentially a mindset that we're, we're really talking about coordination. Um, and I, I think what we should be doing is, is really thinking much more in terms of, of, of planning. It needs to be a much more, um, you know, a, a broad uh, uh, exercise. I don't want to use the same terminology over and over again. Now, I think there are, are pathways to kind of get there, uh, you can uh, create a, a bottom-up uh, framework. You can ask the, the regions to uh, harmonize schedules, uh, as uh, Commissioner Phillips re referred to. I think it's uh, getting uh, uh, the data and data sets aligned. I think uh, the benefit category should also be aligned. I think flexibility is important and valuable but I think there are times when, when you need to step away from uh, flexibility and recognize that in order to get things done, there needs to be consistency. And when you're asking regions to work together to, uh, to build something, you need uh, that consistency. So you can call it harmonization, you can call it um, other things, but it, uh, it so, uh, the points that I wanted to make are, uh, you know, a bottom up regional planning uh, process. So I think that's kind of, uh, re reinvigorating the coordinating bodies that we have between uh, regions is a potential path forward. I think there's a top down path. I think it's maybe looking at some of the uh, national uh, planning exercises that are underway and uh, thinking how we can leverage those and maybe institutionalize those into the future. Uh, as uh, Commissioner Phillips referred to, the I think of it as simplifying and coordinating schedules so there isn't a misalignment of the uh, planning that's going on between regions and uh, the planning exercises that are going on through the planning or coordinating bodies. Uh, Commissioner Scripps has emphasized uh, cost allocation, but uh, cost allocation is also a question of uh, benefits and recognizing uh, the benefits because the cost allocation should be following the benefits and we should have an alignment of the underlying assumptions that um, help uh, round out and allow us to quantify those benefit uh, categories. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Brown, Mr. Terrell. Thank you. I, I have been really enjoying the, the conversation and discussion. Um, I, I do want to point out a couple of things when we're talking about planning and, and coordination and cost allocation, which is the elephant in the room, is what I said to Commissioner Scripps earlier. Um, I think coordination among the regions uh, is, is very valuable. And as we've heard conversation and discussion about coordination that we see 
among PJM and MISO and, and their joint operating agreement. I think that we might be able to, to glean some best practices. And I, I know Chairman Scripps kind of alluded to that as well. But we can definitely glean some best practices out of, of looking at what they are doing. Um, because we know that the whole country is not within some type of RTO. Uh, I, in terms of cost allocation, I think the, I'm the one that talks about cost allocation the most. <laughs> and that's okay, because that also recognizes the diversity within within among the states, but also the diversities within each region. Um, as I started out my conversations earlier and talked about Pennsylvania is, is a, a state that exports a lot of, of energy. And it's okay to say that. And it's okay because we, we're also uh, working well within our RTOs as we see the needs of other parts of the country. So when I talk about cost allocation, in terms of allocating uh, interregional cost, uh, my emphasis would be to say that uh, we want to make sure that we maintain the order 1000 cost allocation principles and that you know cost allocation remain in the forefront. Another thing that I want to point out in my comments is that um, when we're looking at cost allocation for interregional transmission, just acknowledging, and we've heard that before, that it varies among the RTOs because cost regional cost allocation differs with regard to what benefits can be counted within the region. And, then that, and that's another big part of our discussion where we see the benefits, how we define benefits and things of that nature. So, you know, two regions may be using different cost benefit analysis. And it's important to continue these conversations to just enlighten ourselves on that and acknowledge that and figure out where we can go. So I, I just point those out. Those are my general comments in terms of this section. Thank you. Mouths. Thank you. Uh, just to emphasize the, the theme of what uh, Commissioner Phelps was saying, we do not spend enough time talking about the cost of not doing something on reliability and resilience related to interregional transfer capability and connection. Uh, you know, by definition, interregional planning is different from regional planning and requires two entities that have different uh, to, to Commissioner Duffley's point, sets of resources, benefit determination, methodologies, planning approaches. But you have to do that. You have to figure out a way to do those things together. And the Order 1000 interregional coordination process kind of just assumed those differences would go away. They don't go away. And so, so how do you do something that allows us to maybe not build the whole house, or, uh, but, but start with the, the foundation or get the garage in place because we're in trouble if we don't do something, right? How do we walk, not run? And I think, you know, if we think about um, regional lines that have been developed, I've never met a regional line that was with an overestimated set of benefits, right? The benefits estimations are conservative. So if we go and we just think about these traditional benefits, reduce loss of load, right? And add into it the mitigation of extreme weather impacts and add into it, you know, weather uncertainty. We're going to, to your point, Chair Scripps, be able to cover the costs of the of, of new interregional lines. So is there a way in this limited set of some metric that has to be consistent across regions because two regions with different sets of approaches have to do it together? That we can get out from under, you know, we can leave alone people's regional planning processes and their own approaches, but we can get at this interregional transfer capability as a first step, right? As a as a way to start um, fixing some of the problems we're seeing uh, and and addressing the the challenge at hand, um, because I can't imagine getting through two planning processes and two cost allocation projects and actually making progress on this. What's changed? What is different relative to to the setup we have? Um, I think doing that allows us to try, it provides a platform from which maybe we build and we figure out how the market transactions work across those platforms. And we start to fix some of those ancillary problems, right? And maybe we even think about building bigger backbone lines because we now have some, some experience uh, under our feet. I, I, I think um, it doesn't have to interrupt ongoing efforts, things that are going well. Nothing the commission, I think the one place where I'll, I won't speak for my commissioners, but I, I, my understanding is none of us want to screw up 
good things going on. And so this is, this is a way of trying to get at that. We can recognize efforts that are going on. And we, I think we have demonstrated that in, in the language in our uh, regional planning proposal and our interconnection proposal as well. So I really think this is an opportunity to start with interregional transfer capability in a way that respects regions, but recognizes we have to do the two or three regions on any given uh, need have to do it together and therefore have to use methodologies that are comparing apples to apples to get to any outcome um, based on these reliability and resilience benefits around which there's there's shared agreement. Mr. Rushoff. I want to underscore a few things that have been said already. Uh, I think Chair Scripps said it early on that FERC really is uniquely positioned to come up with solutions here. States can't do it, RTOs can't do it, the regions can't do it. And in the West, I agree with Chair LeVar, but I, I disagree in part. I think we we certainly will need, well, maybe maybe I'm picking a fight. No, I don't, I just think it's <laughs> interesting. I don't know that he, I don't know that Dad actually disagrees. But there's no question we'll need interregional planning and transfer capability for resiliency and uh, reliability purposes. We, we are increasingly interconnected. The West is facing tremendous challenges, fires, drought, uh, heat storms. Last summer, California played a unique role in helping the Northwest, which was suffering an unusual heat wave through our exports. And we we benefit greatly from imported energy to help with our resiliency and reliable needs. But in the West, we now have six states which have 100% zero carbon electricity goals, five in addition to California. And we have utilities in virtually every, major utilities in virtually every state that have adopted net zero goals. We have a lot of corporate customers with a very strong decarbonization goals. And we're not yet at Chair French's utopia of demand, uh, of load being next to generation. So we will need a lot of interregional, uh, in we, will, we'll, we will need a lot of interregional projects, I think, going forward for all of, of these needs. Uh, so this is in the West, especially since we have had, like everywhere else, we haven't had this process working. It, it's essential. In terms of going forward, what suggestions uh, to move the ball. I'm, I'm going to reiterate what I said before, the importance of basic reforms to the regional planning process uh, so that they are more long term, more forward looking, have a broader range of benefits, and so that those can then be incorporated into whatever interregional collaboration or planning happens. I do think that would make a big difference in the West where app, other than KISO, there are not that many entities that engage in this kind of long-term planning, resources that are outside the interconnection queue, and so forth. We've talked about the coordination of timelines, modeling. I, I don't know if this is exactly what Commissioner Phillips said, but I think I would argue these are challenging, but these are not existential issues. They can be overcome uh, through collaboration. I think the Benefits question is really challenging, and we've talked a lot about the bottoms up or, or, or top down. I think Commissioner Clement talked about apples to apples comparisons. Uh, I don't know that this is a consensus view in the West. California's been pushing the argument that we should have a uh, uh, at least a minimum set of common benefit categories that planning entities have to utilize in their transmission in their transmission planning process and the regions can characterize those benefits differently but something like that seems to be a prerequisite in order to facilitate the kind of comparable analysis planning and especially cost allocation process that's necessary for interregional planning to uh, to really work but the devils there's a lot of details and there's a lot of devils in those details <laughs> I also support what other folks have said about stronger guidance for how cost allocation should occur among the interregional projects. 
because without that, it becomes kind of an academic exercise. People can talk and talk, and it, it's not meaningful if we're not if we don't know who's going to pay uh, pay and, and under what cost allocation regime. There are I, there there are some reform proposals in track one of the NOPER about information sharing and identifying and jointly evaluating in a regional projects that may be more efficient or cost effective than through individual regional planning and I, that's those are those are good steps they're they're not insignificant steps and i just want to underscore one one thing that underlies all of this for i think for for all of the states but certainly for california we are really concerned about affordability. We are very sensitive to costs given how dramatically our transmission rates have escalated. They're among the highest in the country. We face a rate crisis. So when we're thinking about the benefits of these interregional projects, we really may to make sh need to make sure that from a cost perspective, the projects really pencil out for each, each region and each state. I just don't want to lose sight of that. And of course, that goes for all the current proposed transmission reforms. But since I have the moment, my moment at the mic, I'm going to make the point here. So I want to just I want to feed back just a, a, a little less, maybe from going from where we are to more and more complex pieces that I heard, and then just open it up for us to discuss your reactions to what your fellow commissioners and task force members um, said. Um, so starting from what FERC has already put in motion for regional planning, um, the idea of improving regional planning in each region could help interregional planning. So and that's making it more long term, more multivariate. Um, more portfolio based. Um, and then the sort of next layer was improving coordination um, between the different regions. And one of the main things that we heard several times were just on the time frame issue alone um, could be quite helpful, but also around data sets and common data sets. The, the next layer is it seems to be around benefits and um should there be some minimum number of benefits that are common across the regions even if others are um are, are up to each uh, each region but particularly i think what we've been honing in on is at least around reliability and resiliency should those benefits be more better articulated and common and particular standardized the methodology for assessing them. Um, and then I think the next layer would be cost allocation and um, how is it that um, we, is there guidance that's needed from FERC on, um, on interregional cost allocation that would be helpful or does that need to be worked out between each region ex ante some, somehow so that that is known um, ahead of time as we're moving into this. And then the last piece, which in some of your minds was the first piece is, um, should, is a sort of an, an important or maybe an easy fix that things would then help line up um is to consider whether there should be some minimum level of transfer capability um, among the regions that's either a percentage or done by a study or negotiated but uh, with some guidance so those are the types of things that i heard um, i may have left some important things out but um, if we just sort of think about it as kind of different layers or things that we can tap into so let me uh, let me hear first. I'd like to hear from a few of the commissioners that didn't speak, and then and then the others can jump in. So, uh, Chair French, just a, a very quick thought on cost allocation. Um, I think 
at least our experience in SPP has been, um, we've had a much easier time with the planning when we've been able to settle on a, a, a cost allocation up front. Um, and, and in a perfect world, um, I would hope that, that maybe we could do something similar um, from an interregional standpoint. It's easier when, when projects are built on, on, this, on a similar basis. Uh, for instance, if we are in agreement that the reason for building projects is, is resilience and, and prevention of service interruptions, I see a real possibility there um, that there could be a more across the board cost allocation. For example, um, it, it's this way in SPP and I suspect it's this way in most regions that when you have a service interruption, those interruptions are split among the zones uh, based on load ratio share. And, show, and so it, it sort of makes sense to me that if a line is justified on the basis of present, preventing service interruptions, a simple cost allocation uh, spreading costs across uh, all the local zones based on their load ratio share, because that's how they would experience uh, outages, um, something like that could be quite simple. It gets much more difficult and much more granular if you start to justify lines based on economic benefits or public policy benefits. If those are the underlying reasons we're building, um, then you probably do have to get more granular. But um, I guess that's one more reason maybe to focus more on, on resilience. Chair Thomas. Um, thank you. The reason I think that the minimum transfer should be the first thing considered is I think it simplifies some of the others. And to, to build on uh, Commissioner French's point, if you have a minimum transfer capability for resilience, you don't know who's going to be the buyer or the seller. SPP was a buyer during uh, winter storm Uri, and uh, Commissioner Rex often pointed out that there was an instance where Oregon was a buyer. You don't know. It simplifies the cost allocation to set the minimum. It, it also it simplifies the benefit calculation by basically assuming benefits. And I'd rather in that if you can study rigorously and get the level set right, I'd rather spend that money than trying to come up with a formula that measures the impact of what might happen and use that to come up with a, with a cost allocation methodology. I think the minimum transfer benefit solves a lot of those other problems. I'd also like to agree with what Commissioner Phillips said. We've laid down a marker we saw the benefits of transfer capability with your with winter storm Mary. it's not a mystery anymore we have a good solution or a potentially good solution we still need to study it that we know will provide benefits and we're in a foot race between implementing the solution and the next time we get hit and laying down a marker is important because if somebody gets hit and we didn't act, it's on us. We don't get the Monday morning quarterback. We got to play on Sunday. So, but, but that's part of the appeal of that is these very complicated questions are simplified if you can get that resilience level set right. And in a jurisdiction question, if to me, let's get started. Let's do it with the RTOs. If the non RTOs don't like it, you know, or want to study it or want to see what happens, that's their choice. As Commissioner Phillips pointed out, when you do that, you're picking up a pair of dice and you're hoping. Commissioner Dossi, you are next. No. Um, Commissioner Allen. And Commissioner. I just wanted to speak to the uh, minimum transfer capability, which I, I find uh, an interesting concept and, and idea. And, um, but what I hear from my colleagues uh, when uh, I hear mention of it is uh, more of a focus on reliability and, and resilience. I do wonder if you know, that, that kind of minimum capability has its place somehow in, uh, in, uh, in, in NERC, in, uh, Helping to kind of identify what that level should be and whether it should vary between regions and, uh, uh, you know, essentially uh, the the practical aspects of uh, establishing what something like that might appropriately be set at. Chair Brown, your trial. 
I too quickly just want to talk about that the, the concept of a minimum um, transfer capacity capability. So I think I brought it up in my original com uh, comments as well, and saying that we need to identify what it is and, and, and looking at a study. But I also think that in that we need to recognize that it's going to be different within the regions within the country as well. So that that builds upon the flexibility that we keep talking about. Uh, so I just emphasize that flexibility, knowing that there will be a difference within the regions of the country. Chair sure, Stein. Uh, Commissioner uh, Rechtschaffen noted a moment ago of affordability, um, and, and we need to keep an eye out on, on that cost containment and cost allocation. But we recognize that none of this is going to be cheap. Everything is, is going up in, in cost. These transmission build outs, I've seen some pretty significant overruns lately. Um, developers bid one price, they win the bid, but by the time the project is ready to be delivered, you see a, a substantial cost overrun. So we need to be mindful of, of the environment that we're working in. But to pick up on the theme that uh, Chair Brown Dutrell just mentioned, I think minimum transfer capability is going to be important. I don't think we could be overly prescriptive from, from one region to the next. It's going to be very different. We'll have to take a look at um, the particular needs of the, the planning regions. I, I, I also think it's, it's um, critically important that we ask why hasn't this happened over the past um, 10 plus years? We have processes in place. Uh, FERC has laid them out for, for quite some time and interregional lines of any magnitude are not being built. And perhaps there's not sufficient incentives to uh, have either the RTOs, the planning regions, the developers propose these projects. And while oftentimes we're, we're long on process as regulators and it makes sense to, to have factors and benefits and scenarios outlined, we have to be mindful as well that sometimes incentives are necessary to get these projects built. Uh, the question comes back, we, we study, study, we, we restudy, and we wash and, and we dry and we, we start again. Uh, we really don't have much more time to, to waste before some of these needed projects are developed. So the question might not be, can we afford them? The question might be, uh, can we afford to not to, to build them? Chair Scripps? I wanted to pick up on Chair Stanek's last point because I, I, don't, I don't disagree in terms of um, the potential use of incentives, but, but even more so agree with the question of why they're not getting built. And I, I think Commissioner Phillips raised this as well in terms of that you sort of look, and, and Commissioner Clements, that you look at it in each individual RTO and then you've got to line it up and if the benefits don't speak to each other. And I'm wondering if there's a role here uh, in particular to try and um, seek some coordination with the um, DOE's National Transmission Planning Study. Um, because I think the RTO regions are going to study what's best for their RTO regions. It's just how it works. And MISO is never going to plan for what's best for MISO and PJM together because that's outside. And there would be a lot of pushback on both sides of the boundary if they did. Um, but is there a, a, an overlay um, in terms of the the NTPS that may very well be able to identify some projects, in fact, the projects that are, are likely or least likely to be picked up in individual RTO planning processes, but may still serve an important national interest. And that may be beyond the scope of what we can do here, but trying to think of how do you identify the projects that aren't being elevated to the point of why aren't these projects being built if they, if they provide the benefits, I still think that's a question you've got to explicitly answer, but it may be that we're just not, we don't up until now have the planning overlay in terms of what, what a national uh, map like would look like in addition to what's being developed um, by the regions and even sort of the seams issues between the regions. So I think we're going to, we're going to transition in a moment to talking more about what we, what you'd want FERC or other entities to do on the, this issue about the minimum transfer capability as well as the other issues that we've been talking about. But I, I guess I just, before we left this, I just, this isn't a concept that we talked about at the task force before. So if there are task force members that have 
you're hearing kind of an upswelling of numerous task force members about this issue. So if there are task force members that have some serious reservations about this, again, we'll talk about, we, we've heard about it, it should, shouldn't necessarily be one size fits all and could should be based on a study. But if you have some more fundamental concerns about the idea, it would be a good time now just to raise it so that other commissioners, other task force members are aware of it before we spend a lot of time talking about it, continue to talk about it. I want to presume it. Yeah, Commissioner Duffy, Danley. So there's this famous story about a, uh, <clears throat> a diplomatic meeting between a State Department officer from America and one from France. An American State Department officer talks about the glories of this regulatory regime in America and how complicated it is, but how beautifully it works, how everything is perfect in the end. And the French diplomatic officer says to him, that is amazing, I, and I can hear that it works in practice, but does it work in theory? Right? <laughs> so, so adopting the role there of the French bureaucrat for a second, I have heard a little bit of the language of coercion, a little bit of the appeal that FERC can play a special role to help with this sort of thing, and of course we can. The question I have is, just like the does it work in theory, what showing is necessary for us under our statute to actually impose anything? And I will, go, I will tell you that I am, I, from, and of course, we're not at the point of adducing evidence to the record here. We're just talking. I get that. But I have yet to hear anything that makes me think we're going to be able to make that showing for, for us to actually impose something. And I get it. I understand. I appreciate why there would be an appeal to FERC is what seems to be the ultimate instrumentality here that might be able to do something. But as anybody who has listened to anything I've ever said knows, I, I don't believe that every wrong can be remedied under the statutes that we, we administrate. So I just want to point that out as my reservation. And if anybody has any ideas for what that showing would be, I would be delighted to hear them. But I just put that out there because I think that may be fertile ground if people have ideas. Chair LeVar, I don't know if you were reacting or adding your own um, concerns. Yep. No, I'll, I'll just be brief because I, this, this, because of the way this discussion is going, but I don't know how that how minimum transfer capacity would play out in the in the areas that are non RTOs where we have two planning regions that do not have cost allocation authority, or at least only have it in very limited situations. So, I, so as I hear this discussion, that's that's where I go first, which leads me to agree with something that Riley said. If if that's an issue that's going to be pursued, the NERC reliability standards process is a great process for an issue like that, at least in my mind, and so I agree with him on that. Anybody else want to add to that before we move on? Okay. Um, so our the, the last wrap up for this section is on potential actions. And we wanted to talk about what guidance parameters, minimum standards, guardrails, principles would be helpful to facilitate the development of inter-regional transmission. And we just went through a, a, a list of potential areas um, that you've identified um, for this. So, and during this conversation, we wanted specifically what should FERC do? What should others do? We just heard about NERC or DOE um, or the RTOs or states um, themselves do. So it's not limited to FERC actions, but obviously for, uh, that's. Um, that, that's one one important vehicle um, to focus on. So um, we were going to hear kick off again before we open it up first from uh, Chair Lavar and then Chair French and then um, for Commissioner Christie, and then Chair Thomas, Chair Nelson, uh, for Chair Click, and then Chair Stanek. So Chair Lavar. Well, to be a little bit repetitive of what I've already said, I think the most important steps for the Western United States are ones that are already in progress. There's a, there's a lot of forward movement to try to find more um, potential actions to improve interregional planning. If you look at the regions in terms of the two planning regions that are not part of the California ISO within the West, um, you know, there's a lot of move towards towards market development, but there's also um, been the consolidation from three down to two planning regions again, which is a to me a significant step forward and highlights opportunities for continuing to move in that direction. 
Um, and then what's happening at the Western Electricity Coordinating Council also, I think, provides an opportunity for forward movement in this area because of the, the role they played with those two planning entities that are not RTOs, that do not have cost allocation authority. They rely on WEC, in, at least in my knowledge, in a different way than the RTOs do with, with the NERC regional entities in their areas. And why I think under our current construct in the West, WEC can be a valuable tool is because they don't have an agenda other than reliability. Um, when, you're, when you're starting to look at transmission planning on a 20 year horizon, um, one of the challenges with that that we see in our IRPs, because IRPs operate on a 20 year horizon, we have a lot of experience with that, is that when you, when you factor in public policies, those change very quickly. So when you're doing 20 year planning, public policies that can change every two or three years insert a significant challenge into that process. And, and that's why I, I think under our current construct in the non-RTO areas, elevation of WEX role can be valuable because they don't have an agenda, they don't have a policy, their own, well, their only agenda is reliability. And the anchor data sets that they provide right now are the starting point for that process. Their studies and their expertise, I think, can provide more, more value, not just at the beginning of the, of the planning process, but, through, but throughout it. Um, another opportunity for potential action is just more coordination between the two planning groups. As I mentioned, we had, we had one consolidation in recent years, but could, could Northern Grid and West Connect conduct joint footprint studies or consider costs and benefits across, across the region? I'm not at necessarily advocating for a solution on that, but that's something that certainly needs to be on the table for discussion. Um, the challenge, one challenge in the West though, is that stakeholders are of a different mind. Some, some want to really improve this process with Northern Grid and West Connect. Some see that as a roadblock towards RTO development, which is the ultimate goal for a lot of stakeholders. So I don't have a perfect solution, but these are, these are options we need to consider and also consider how one might impact, speed up or slow down developments in another area. And you know, like I said before, it does on minimum transfer capacity, I'm trying to get my head around that during this meeting. Does that, does that concept push Northern Grid and West Connect to be closer to an RTO? Would that require them to exercise some cost allocation authority? Or does that simply push the West closer to RTO developments on other fronts? I, I don't know the answer to that, but that's what I'm trying to think about as we discuss this. Thanks. Chair French. Well, you're never going to guess what I would propose as a <laughs> as a concrete reform that FERC could take. Um, the, as I was putting this together, obviously what came to mind was the minimum transfer capability. I didn't know we'd have so much discussion on it and I kind of held back until now, but I, I think it's important for me to mention it because I want to give our agency credit, the Kansas Corporation Commission and our staff we were one of the very first commenters on the ANOPER to propose that that should be a standard, that that was something we thought FERC could do concrete to, to move forward uh, interregionally. I, I agree with Ted, it's probably a, a walk. It's probably not a crawl, it's probably a walk. It's not a run, um, but you know, we think that's, that's something you can do. We, we put forward a straw proposal of 10%. That was essentially based on uh, the experience uh, during winter storm URI of the level of uh, demand that had to be interrupted and the level of imports that we relied on uh, during that storm. I don't know that we're here saying that's the right number. I've seen numbers as high as 40%. <laughs> um, maybe there needs to be a debate. Uh, I, th I thought Chair Scripps made a really good point. I mean, we could have a uh, an information gathering hearing where you all, um, receive viewpoints on what the right capability is. You could also um, just put forth a requirement to the regions. I don't know about the non-RTO regions, but to the, to the RTOs um, to have them have a proceeding and to uh, make a filing with you of what they are setting that level at. Um, I, I think we could use something like uh, the MISO and SPP experience with the joint targeted interconnection queue uh, study process. That could be a template. That, now that process is aimed at, uh, it's optimized to finding lines that will interconnect generation. But you could have a similar process where they optimize their planning to uh, promote uh, transfer capability. Um, and, and so that, you know, that is one concrete way that I think the RTOs could go about this. 
I also really like the idea, I mean, this does edge much more on, on the NERC standard type of issue. And so, you know, I'd, I'd be curious to know whether there's a, a role for them uh, involved in this. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to go too much farther into this because there's been so much discussion, um, but I guess to Commissioner Danley's point, I mean, it's a really good point. I mean, there has to be an evidentiary basis uh, if something is to be established. It could potentially uh, come from some sort of study with NERC. I would also just say we, we have an empirical basis that probably transmission service was inadequate during winter storm URI. I mean, we, we had service interruptions. We know that, that the lights were kept on while the imports were flowing. When, when the imports became restricted and unavailable to us, the lights went off. Um, and, and we were better off uh, in my region than, than they were in others. Uh, so I, I struggle a bit. We have an empirical example of the, the value or lack of value of what our system provided us and what it could provide with a minimum standard. And, and so I, I frankly think we have a pretty strong evidentiary basis right now that something needs to be done. But, but I, it, the point is well taken that if some sort of specific standard is to be established, there, there has to be a basis under that. Um, I guess, let, let me put one more uh, cherry on top. And this is, uh, this, this goes to the, I guess, aspirations of running, not just walking. Um, you know, a lot of us at the beginning, in our beginning comments, we talked about the growing body of evidence that there is enormous benefits to be had by allowing power to, to freely move about the country. Um, and I think it is probably worth mentioning that while there are big benefits to a minimum interconnectivity standard, these studies I think that we're all referencing, that's not necessarily the, the type of interregional uh, transfers that they are talking about. It, if we do a minimum standard, that's just an incremental step. But sooner or later, we are going to have to focus on some sort of high voltage overlay system, uh, the type of work that DOE is studying right now. And, you know, I, I think until that time, our, our customers are going to be deprived of the more robust, optimized, lowest cost solutions. And, you know, Ted, Ted and I talk all the time, and, and the point is well taken that we have to run or walk before we run. But there are a lot of policy considerations going on right now. There's lots of states and regions um, that are moving in certain directions that I think are going to force us to at least start jogging today, <laughs> even if we have to do it in a stepped fashion. So I, I don't want to slip that, let that slip past. Commissioner Christie. Yeah, Okay. Thank you. Uh, in terms of interregional transfer capacity and talking about a, a minimal transfer capacity, we have to start with a the standpoint. There's interregional capacity today is not zero. I mean, we know transfers are taking place. I heard one remark that it was zero. It's not zero. We have interregional transfers taking place right now. Um, so the question is, what, a minimal transfer capacity, what is the right number? And I think Commissioner Scripps made a great point um, two hours ago when, uh, <laughs> uh, when he said it's not a number, it's a definition. The definition is, is what has to, we have to arrive at. What is, the, what is the definition? So I think that's an important point is, is the minimal transfer capacity is really more of a definition versus just pick a number. Um, I also want to make the point, I think the legal issue is very salient. The, uh, we've heard from two commissioners. Um, Commissioner LeVar from Utah and Commissioner Kim Duffley, both from non from non RTO states. You know what our authority is in a non RTO region is very much a salient issue. It's not an issue for today, but it is very much a salient issue when you talk about the non RTOs and what FERC authority is. With that, thank you. Chair Thomas. And then Chair Nelson, I think I left him out. Thank you. First, as I see, uh, Commissioner Danley's point is not as much evidentiary as statutory, but I think the question is, uh, are the resilience and reliability obligation is sufficient to cover that, in my view. I'm sure uh, Learned Council will dis differ uh, all over the map, as, as, as always. Uh, with, with respect to the time thing I mentioned, that was more of a thing is an example that wasn't loaded with any policy connotations, but a process thing. We've 
I would, I would guess we probably mostly solved that problem already. I don't know that, but that was more of an example. But I think the modeling thing is, is really important. I think there's a core consensus around the fact that the pace of change means that we need a longer planning horizon. And a longer planning horizon, by definition, requires more reliance uh, on models. And if you use the NOPE or 20 years for scenarios, that's a lot of models. And when the models are incompatible, it's difficult to do interregional planning. A proposed solution on that would be some sort of a convening. And, and you know, model nerds are pretty intense about the attributes of their preferred model. But, but a convening where they could discuss modeling and steps towards compatibility, you don't need the same model, you just need compatible results with, a, with perhaps what I would view as a Clean Air Act style, you can keep your model, but when you upgrade your model, there's some compatibility standards as a specific thing to get more compatibility with respect to modeling because you got to have consistent models if you're going to lengthen your planning horizon. Thank you. We beam Chair Nelson then. So I want to follow up on something Chair uh, Scripps said and indicated in the last bit. It, the regions right now are not necessarily the right entities to do the interregional planning because that is not their priority. I know that my ISO, ISO New England, has plenty of work and they are backlogged. Uh, you know, I think we've been supportive of them adding additional staff with the amount of things going on. Imagining them uh, trying to coordinate with the New York or a PJM area, uh, they're not staffed for that and that's not really within their current capabilities or capacities. So, you know, I think we, we've kind of found a donut hole a little bit. So I think I agree a little bit with what uh, Commissioner Danley said. We've got to figure this out. I think that we know that the current structure doesn't work. And I think that there's a clear case and there would be a clear record um, that the current structure isn't set up to do this in a regional. I think we can also say there's a clear benefit that can be uh, received from customers as well. Um, to me, you know, when I think about that, the, um, the practices for interstate gas uh, seem to apply here well, uh, where FERC kind of approves that in absence of a regional RTO. Um, I understand that's definitely not the explicit uh, language of the Federal Power Act, but I think the uh, applicability is, is the same. I also wanna say I agree with uh, Ted Thomas. Uh, the modeling is gonna be critical here when we talk about making the case for why we should go through the effort of building this in the first place. Making a model that can spit out comparable results uh, is gonna be critical. We should keep that in mind when we're thinking about how these things are gonna be designed, when we're thinking about what categories of benefit uh, to allow and what uh, categories of benefits to approve. And I think that makes a ton of sense when we think about interstate interoperability so that we can make sure that we're dealing in the same language when we're trying to coordinate. Sure, Gluck. Thank you. I, you know, I, I was uh, on the plane out here, I was reading a number of the comments and it struck me how many of them, including the Kansas Corporation Commission's comments, um, had advocated for the minimum transfer capacity and struck, and, and obviously the discussion today, there seems to be a lot of support for it. Now, not complete support for it, and we need to think through a lot of issues. Commissioner Danley's issue is not an irrelevant one at all. It's one we've been given some thought to and we've been having some discussions about. I do I think, I think there's an argument, but I think we, we need to think, to think it through a little further about our uh, the commission's uh, statutory authorities and, and where it lies, both in terms of sections 205 and 206, but also our reliability authority under, under, under uh, along with NERC under two, section 215 of the Federal Power Act. Not to get too specific about the statutes. <laughs> um, I would say that there's, you know, there's, I think there are an enormous amount we talked about in the reliability and resilience benefits, and, but it's also pointed out by, by Chair French, it, it's not, there are other interregional projects that are, that could provide significant other benefits that would be well beyond uh, minimum transfer capacity. But I do think 
given the, you know, I think we also owe, owe, owe a duty to take a, take a step back and see how, um, assuming we move, the commission moves forward with what we call track one and track two in terms of our proposed rules regarding cost allocation, regional cost allocation, regional uh, tr uh, transmission planning, as well as interconnection reform, take a look at those and see and see after that what what else is needed from an interregional perspective. I think we need to figure out a way to, to see how, how that works first. Um, but I, 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 I do think it's something that's worth going forward. The one other issue I wanted to raise, and I, under, I understand the point that, you know, it's a lot easier to do this if we if we go forward to do this. It's a lot easier to do this between RTO regions. But I, I do worry and something I think we need to think quite a lot about, about the implications of not having, if we were to move forward with minimum transfer capability and only do it between, between RTOs, what the implications are for not doing it in areas with non-RTOs. Um, uh, first in California is an RTO, but obviously the rest of the West isn't, so you wouldn't have everyone you border with, you wouldn't be able to do that. I, I think there's, you know, if we're, if we're talking and, I, and, I, and you know, Commissioner Phillips had it right, it's on us, and, and, and Chair Thomas said this too, it's on us if, if next time around something bad happens and we didn't act. And we need to think about it as well from the, um, the, the standpoint of non-RTO non -RTO areas as well. Also areas where you have non-RTO utilities, but RTOs. And how do we address that? For instance, I think TVA and other utilities in the Southeast also played a role. I, I pointed out PJM, but utilities in the Southeast, non-RTO areas, played a role in, in providing power, as I understand it, to SPP and MISO as well during Winter Storm Uri. So those are all issues that I really do think that we need to, cons we need to consider and, and really think, think thoroughly through before we make a judgment as best to what, if we, assuming we go forward with something like this, we make a judgment as whether um, minimum transfer capability is the way to go. So the, the bulk power system doesn't respect the, the grids of the, or the boundaries of the respective planning authorities. Uh, the electrons flow where the electron flows and ultimately we need a very efficient process to connect the regions. Anytime when you have more than one organization involved, the, the efficiencies begin to decline. And in preparation for this meeting today, I've read a number of uh, well-sourced reports on this issue and they're all, they've all been issued within the past uh, one year, including the MIT report, Princeton, uh, University of California, Brattle and General Electric, uh, all produced reports on sort of the barriers and opportunities of, of interregional uh, transmission planning. The Brattle report in particular responded to what Chair Scripps um, was outlining just a, a few moments ago with respect to the fact, do we need to bring another chair to this table in the form of uh, an independent authority such as what they refer to as a central planning authority? It's, it's not a bad idea to consider because uh, as our RTOs, as we've just heard um, from Chair Nelson, may not be equipped um, to interact, to plan interregionally. They're trying, I, I believe they're trying, but I, I don't believe, uh, as I stated earlier, that we've, we've um, achieved the goals as outlined in, in order uh, 2000, 1000. In response to uh, Commissioner Danley, what, what I see is, I believe FERC does have a, a path forward in terms of having the statutory authority under the, the FPA. And I would say that is we see a lot of regional and sub-regional transmission being built now um, to the point where we may see some overbuilding in some regions resulting in possibly unjust and unreasonable rates. And I would think that if there's, a, there's any hook, and there may be more than one, um, it would be the the overbuilding of regional transmission. Uh, that's just one I ha haven't checked with general counsel yet, but that might be a, a possibility. <laughs> but I recognize that you raise a good question. What is the avenue? What's the hook for FERC to come in here and, and clear, clear the field? Uh, minimum ATC, uh, that's obviously one issue. Our friends in the West will have to figure out what the, the path forward is there. But it, it's not, I, I would not argue that that's the cure-all. Uh, there are, will be other details that would need to be worked out in tariffs, uh, probably with the assistance of NERC, and we'd have to, if anything, make sure that uh, these standards are flexible, case-by-case -case basis, region-by-region. -region. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Well, thank you. So we, we have a few minutes before we break for other um, listeners to comment on Task force members on what you've just heard from your 
around the table on potential solutions. And I, I think I just want to um, just add, we, we again heard a lot about the minimum transfer capability issue and a little bit about um, more around coordination. Um, not so much about um, what FERC should do around interregional cost allocation or the benefits. I'm just going back to the list that we had before. So if anybody wants to kind of has some specific thoughts on what FERC should do around interregional cost allocation or common benefits around resiliency and reliability, you can add that. But um, yeah, so let's just take some more. Um, Mr. Duffley and then Commissioner Allen. So I just briefly wanted to talk about uh, minimum transfer capacity, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Christie that it should not be a minimum number. And I agree with Commissioner Christie, um, the RTOs and, and transmission owners in non-TRO states, they already have a joint operating agreement that's on file. And so energy does go back and forth. So that is there, but uh, we need a definition so that uh, non-RTO states are not burdened with a too high of a any type of minimum transfer capacity. Because keep in mind that um, non-RTO states are very structured very differently than RTO states. I mean, they really have a strong IRP process. We have strong reliability in the Southeast and we have our generation that's very close to load. And so uh, uh, until we see cracks in that process, uh, I think there is a just and reasonableness or unjust and unreasonableness to, to require those states to build additional transmission that may, that they see that may not be needed. Thank you. Ms. Rowell. My, my comment's a little bit uh, different. I, I just wanted to, uh, even though I'm very intrigued by the idea of this uh, minimum transfer capability, there is kind of a, a facet of it that caused me uh, some anxiety. If it leads to, you know, kind of stopgap uh, solutions that are kind of uh, singularly focused on one category of benefit, that, uh, category of benefits, uh, that can have the practical effect of, you know, undercutting uh, the um, you know, benefit cost or the economic case for uh, you know, a, a larger solution. And um, I, I would like to think that uh, we can uh, we, we can essentially uh, solve uh, multiple problems at any time. Uh, there should be a minimum probably for reliability and resilience reasons, but that, that doesn't mean that the projects that are developed need to be singularly focused on just that, that one category. Thank you. And then um, yeah. also, I forgot to mention that the central planning authority idea that just came out was also something that nobody else has since it came out late. So if anybody wants to add any thoughts on on that or what that might look like, um, go ahead. Chief Thomas. I'd like to agree with what uh, Commissioner Allen just said there. We had this north south MISO issue. Um, there's even litigation surrounding it, and there was some folks that suggested there was a, a an, an upgrade of the transfer capability, but the ends of of the new upgrade <laughs> were black holes <laughs> that didn't go anywhere particularly useful. Um, and and I as the economist said, you don't want the sole driver to be the minute it needs to be more useful to the system. And that's a very complicated and difficult question. But I think that that needs to, uh, to be examined. A second point I would make, and, and I think I heard echoes of a preference for uniformity from Commissioner Glick, or Chair Glick, but, but I don't want to wait. If folks have reservations, and it takes five years to litigate jurisdiction issues all the way to the Supreme Court. I'd rather move where we can move and risk not being uniform. And if folks don't want to do it, I respect that. But but there's risks they're taking and there's cost risks that the other folks are taking. 
and I'm fine with everybody figuring out those risks themselves, but I'd rather not wait in the places where we think we can act. Thank you. Chair Stanek. One issue that, that we didn't touch on so far to date is the, uh, the siting authority that the state commissioners have to, to build some of these. And we've recognized that there's been lots of good projects in theory that were never able to actually make it into fruition or development. You could easily have one state that blocks a, a multi-state, multi-value project from ever being developed. All goes to say that the states need to be um, brought into the process in order to make this an efficient process very early rather than at the end um, so that hopes we don't get our hopes up that this interregional project because it's likely going to cross this well it will cross the state line uh, and it will cross a planning region line as well that we have all of the voices um, that could potentially veto a project at the table up front. Any final thoughts on anything that you've heard before we wrap up our interregional conversation on FERCOS and writes a multi hundred page order on interregional <laughs> issues? So, Commissioner Allen. Yeah, I just wanted to lend some support for the um, concept that uh, Chair Stanek laid out for this cent central uh, planning authority that uh, could potentially put, play a role in helping to rationalize things going forward. And, and the purpose of the central planner would mainly be to identify interregional projects? Yeah, from at least my standpoint, the, the, the role would be to essentially fill the, what I perceive to be the, the planning gaps that, that are, are out there. You can do it in, uh, in a very region, in interregion specific manner, or you can do it interconnection wide, or even nation nationwide. And we have, you know, a planning effort that is taking place uh, currently, led by uh, DOE and the national labs. That's the kind of planning I think that really needs to be institutionalized in uh, some way to help to kind of rationalize what is going on in different places across the country and. There could be a role for uh, you know, a central planning authority of some sort to uh, uh, help rationalize. Uh, but that's my perception of what I heard from uh, uh, Chair Stanek. Uh, I'll let him speak for himself. Chair Gluck. So I wanted to address that kind of in, a, in a broader con context. So again, we're, if we're talking about interregional transfer capacity, that's, that's somewhat limited. But I think there's no doubt in all these studies that have been referenced, Brattle and GE and, and, and MIT and other studies, they all call for much broader and bolder action, um, primarily to achieve policies, whether they be utility policies or state policies or somewhat limited federal policies um, aimed at massive reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I think a central planning authority is a big part of that, but I also think it even goes broader than that in terms of building and paying for um, uh, some of these interregional lines that are gonna be needed. And it strikes me, and this is more of a, it's not something I think FERC can do, but I think this is something the government, the Department of Energy in particular, but others need to figure out. We need to figure out, this is kind of like, you know, when, we, when the highways were built in the 1950s, we always used this analogy, but this is really the type, the type of analogy when we need, we need some sort of national approach if we're gonna achieve these types of benefits. And I think we're gonna need, in terms of paying for, siting, and, uh, and, and and planning for uh, these particular ma massive interregional transmission projects to get to the benefits that again the, the studies identify. Commissioner Duffley, I just had a quick quick question about the central planning authority. Who who would order the transmission owner? Who would have the authority to order the transmission owner to actually build a project under this type of um, planning authority? Yeah, I, I, I'm just going to answer. From, uh, others can answer as well. I, I don't, I'm not entirely sure that that there's an answer to that, or there is authority currently. I think it, it's something that, in my opinion, Congress needs to address. Right. I, I believe that the the CPA, the CPA concept, would have to be enacted by the legislature. So, who, who, uh, which among you is going to run for Congress? <laughs> <laughs> 
So on that note, um, <laughs> so I'll take a much needed break for half an hour. We'll start at four and we're going to go back to the uh, first note. For those out in the hallway, if you could come back and join us. <laughs> <laughs> so I know there's at least one or two commissioners that have planes to catch. So, as I mentioned before, um, the second topic is on on FERC's first uh, NOPER, not a NOPER, in this uh, process, um, which was uh, focused primarily on regional planning cost allocation, and was released um, in April, and um, and not on the second NOPER on interconnection that was released uh, in June. Um, and just so everybody is reminded that the uh, comments in this NOPER are due on August 17th and the reply comments on September 19th. And we collectively thought that this would be a good opportunity for the state commissioners to share some of their evolving personal insights and recommendations as they review the NOPER and prepare to comment, to give a chance to kind of bounce things off each other and, um, and, and also with the FERC commissioners. Um, these are not the formal NARA comments. Those are still under development. This is really meant for the individual state commissioners to share their pers perspectives. And we're chunking this into three parts. First, we'll talk about um, planning, and then we'll talk about cost allocation. And finally, we'll talk about uh, other uh, topics, which include the uh, right of first refusal and the construction work in progress and anything else that is not covered by planning and, and cost allocation that was uh, in the order that you'd like to provide feedback on. And once we've heard from a few state commissioners to kick it all off, we'll open it up for everybody and, um, and uh, obviously welcome the FERC commissioners for asking any questions and things that you hear um, or explaining something that maybe um, state commissioners have questions about or based on what they said, you don't think that they understood what you meant. Um, so it's just a chance uh, for the first time to now take the task force process into when an OPER's out and on the table. So um, we're gonna start with uh, transmission uh, planning. Um, and again, we'll have a few uh, few state commissioners and then we'll open it up. Um, we've got Chair Stanek and um, Chair Nelson from Massachusetts and Chair Scripps. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Uh, I believe uh, the FERC, our FERC colleagues here uh, clearly understood and heard some of our messages over the course of the past three task force uh, meetings. And as we uh, conclude today, I, I think we've gained at least some consensus and see eye to eye on some of the issues that we just discussed over the past two hours. Transmission planning on this topic has, has been difficult uh, over the, the past 20 years. I was at FERC for a long time, sat in a lot of these technical conference ballrooms trying to figure out some of these, these thorny issues. It's been 11 years since the last major uh, FERC rule with Order 1000 and the rule that we're, the pending rule that we're going to be discussing for the next hour or so, uh, the track one cost allocation and transmission planning rule um, is, uh, is important. You just mentioned we'll be giving our personal perspectives. 
we don't represent whatever comment that neighborhood ultimately files. We do our best to represent our, our regions, however. Uh, with respect to transmission planning, uh, I've seen a tremendous amount of problems with Order 1000 resulting in transmission not being constructed in this country. Uh, the the fail, failures date back for, for a, a number of reasons. Um, competition, in theory, is great. We, we want to incentivize that. But competition also, in many respects, makes every utility a transmission-dependent utility. We've seen some success stories of competitive transmission being built, but we've seen a lot of other uh, unintended outcomes, unintended side effects where sub-regional projects are being built in favor of regional projects. Uh, I've heard an earful over the course of the past uh, two and a half days from uh, renewable developers, from utilities. Basically, I've, I've heard a lot from all quarters saying that transmission uh, in this competitive environment does not work the way that FERC envisioned 11 years ago. It's my hope, uh, and I hope I speak for the, the macro region, that this track one NOPER will begin to, to chip away, uh, whether it be the proposed ROFR reforms, and the proposed tran transmission planning reforms, requiring these scenarios to be uh, built using seven different factors. And I respect what Commissioner Christie said yesterday at the Electricity Committee meeting, where he showed some concern with the respect as to whether this track one NOPER is being too prescriptive. Um, we do have the nine planning principles, we have the, the 12 uh, benefits, we have a 20 year time horizon with three year updates, um, lots of other requirements. And I recognize that there was a call for flexibility in the ANOPA comments, both from NARUC, from the RTOs, from others. I think we must be cognizant when it comes to transmission planning that not all of our regions and clo closer to home, not all of our RTOs are in the same position. Some RTOs in this room have basically said, we got this. The level of prescriptiveness in the track one NOPA may set us back. I've heard from other RTOs that are saying, we need this, we need this level of, of benefits and factors and scenarios in order to, uh, to deliver. So my one re request representing the Mid-Atlantic region with my, my colleague from Pennsylvania is that there needs to be some level of, of flexibility so there's not redundancy, particularly with regions that are, are well ahead of others. Transmission is being built regionally in some planning regions, in some RTOs, and we're seeing less of that in, in others. So um, I will uh, throw that out there, uh, but I am concerned with the state of competition in the country. It's not working as it was intended to be, and we have some major problems to fix, and hopefully this partnership between the state regulators and our FERC colleagues, um, I'm confident that we're on our way. Thank you. We grab uh, Chair Nelson again. Uh, thanks for letting me um, uh, talk today. I, I'm broadly supportive of the, uh, the FERC findings to incorporate um, scenario analysis into our transmission planning. Um, I, I think I want to talk a little bit about why that's important because developing and utilizing long term scenarios and creating a flexible planning tool is going to help address some of the uncertainty involved in identifying transmission needs in regions and talking about resource mixes and evolving demand. And I say that because, um, you know, if you went back five years in ISO New England, you would, you would have forecasted a very, uh, a very downward slope for our, our demand. Our policies have shifted and evolved to incorporate more electrification. We've seen electric vehicles come on the rise. Those types of things need to be looked at both in scenarios that are very optimistic, of what if these things come on very quickly, and scenarios where maybe it, it takes a little bit longer because of chip shortages or lack of consumer um, demand. Uh, so having a range of benefits is gonna be incredibly useful. I know that Massachusetts has undergone our own planning process and trying to achieve our state goals looking forward to 2050. 
that was a data-driven approach, looking at the different policy levels we think we are gonna to have to pull as a state that is going to lead to uh, increases in our region. And we've shared that with ISO New England as part of our long-term assessment. And I think that in the short run, you know, that's something that ISO, it may not seem like it's going to um, uh, push a need in the next three years, but certainly over the next 10, you're going to see a sharp change in that load curve. And I think when we're looking at transmission projects, it's very appropriate for how FERC has framed things to get a uh, scenario-based model that pushes to that level. I also think that the broad benefits that are uh, being talked about are critical. I really believe that having benefit categories that are, are, are not unique uh, to different areas is important. I think allowing that flexibility about what the value of those benefits is in different regions is where the, uh, the difference should come, right? A, you know, uh, obviously the air conditioning load for Arizona will be uh, starkly different than one in Maine. Uh, and so, uh, but no one, uh, no one should debate on what kind of impact or the, uh, the ways at which adding transmission or adding lack of congestion is going to change a region. Those, those categories should be as similar as possible. Um, and I think to that degree, I think that's important because um, I really think that the way we've looked at things and going back to comments I've made earlier about pigeonholing them from FERC Order 1000 into economic reliability and, um, and the public policy is easy for talking about the theoretical. But when we actually build a, a line, when we actually see something come online and look at that payback period, we're really dealing with something that is much more complex and has multifaceted. So I think, you know, I'm going to bleed a little bit here into uh, probably something that will be discussed later on cost allocation, because the one critical element I want to bring up to uh, FERC and to the other commissioners is a key term in uh, the, the NOPR, which is uh, the term seeking. Uh, agreement. So there's uh, a way you can really frame that I think that is important. And I see two forces pushing up against each other. I think we want to balance, right? States not wanting to pay for another state's laws that may not align with them. But I also think we have to balance that states that receive benefits and don't want to pay, that may not be appropriate either. So there really needs to be a balance. And I think in terms of seeking agreement, I would want to really avoid a situation where we would see a single state veto envisioned in that term. Uh, I think that would result in less transmission being built, not more transmission being built. So I think we just need a fair uh, process, a fair democratic process that we've seen instituted in a number of our regions to settle what seeking agreement means. I think we should make sure that it's clear on what it envisions when it says that, because I think that will allow um, us to really get to work with establishing a framework that is fair and just uh, when we are trying to establish both cost allocation and how the benefits are going to get allocated. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Scripps. Thank you. Just a few uh points, and I think I can be fairly quick to allow for more time for discussion. The first is um, something that Commissioner Phillips brought up earlier uh, on the need for additional help with benefit metrics, particularly around resilience. Um, that is true for interregional projects. I think it is equally true for regional projects. And it's an issue that uh, MISO uh, has raised and considered as part of the regional uh, expansion criteria and benefits working group um, it's actually again on the agenda on Tuesday. Um, so it is a, a timely issue and, and one where I think um, getting additional help in terms of informing the planning process, particularly around those, uh, those benefit metrics dealing with resilience is, is a gap that, um, that we could use some help with. The second piece that I would highlight is, and it's one that um, I'm not sure go, whether it goes here or in the other issues, but I'm gonna put it here anyway, because I think it's connected enough to transmission planning. And that is the role of an independent transmission monitor uh, that was flagged in, in the 
in the process. Um, both the state of Michigan and the organization MISO States, and I know a number of others, have endorsed the idea in principle, um, and in particular, um, from the OMS perspective, a, a limited but important role that an independent transmission monitor could uh, play in terms of informing the transmission planning processes taking place within the RTO. Uh, we've seen real benefit, I think, across the board uh, in the independence of the market monitors and see similar benefits potentially uh, from independent transmission monitors that they can, I think, assist in helping to understand the various transmission planning processes, how they're working together, and whether they are, in fact, identifying optimal solutions and providing insight to retail regulators um, into how disparate bottom-up submissions into MISA's annual uh, MTEP process, for example, and whether those are complementary to the top-down processes that we're seeing through the long-range transmission planning process. So I, I do think that the ITM can play an important role in the transmission planning process and, and didn't want to lose that. The third piece uh, is really to focus on the goal here, and I echo some of the concerns that have been raised uh, and raised in comments um, on the um, need to be wary of uh, adding additional compliance burdens or inadvertently pausing or delaying ongoing work, particularly for the regions with active planning uh, processes in place. I think that's an important consideration. Uh, RTO membership remains voluntary. Uh, there is good work taking place and, and I wouldn't want to sort of slow down that work. That said, I think there continues to be a question of whether even the best transmission planning processes taking place are sufficient to what's needed for the system. Uh, and to Chair Thomas's point about there's a foot race uh, that we need to be ready before the next event. And so to the extent that we need to sort of up everybody's game, I think that is a valid role to play and, uh, and to provide additional points for consideration and inclusion in RTO transmission planning processes, but, but being wary of the burdens that are being um, uh, applied uh, as, as we go forward. And then fourth, and this I think echoes uh, what we just heard from Chair Nelson um, and certainly sort of speaks to cost allocation, but I'll do it here so I don't have to speak again. Um, I, I think that, that there is a difference between seeking agreement, uh, which is a, a goal that I certainly endorse and Commissioner Christie particularly appreciate your focus in the concurrence uh, on the need to see uh, the benefits and need to seek agreement on cost allocation from the states. But I don't think that that is the same thing as uh, needing unanimity. We do have a state agreement approach. Uh, and I think there are places where, where there is unanimity, uh, we have a way of sort of documenting that and then moving that forward. I don't know that that is the same thing as seeking input. And I would say that it shouldn't be. Um, I don't know that we can rely on the state agreement approach to build out backbone transmission. Um, but I do think sort of preserving the ability, particularly for states and retail uh, regulators to provide input uh, is important, just as long as it doesn't turn into an opportunity to be defeated. Thanks. Okay, so do other commissioners want to add in either some of your own thoughts or reacting to some of the things that you um, just heard and any also comments on various things like how, was this spe too specific? It should have been more flexible. Did it cut it right? Um, how do we deal with different regions that are in different um, places? So feel free to pile on or ask additional questions of anything. Um, Chair French. Thank you. I'll just add a couple areas of broad agreement and then maybe one specific question or, or maybe it's a comment. Um, I, I agree with a lot of the well first let me say I appreciate the entire number I mean I, I think it moving in the right direction of where most all of us want to see things go so from a high level I, I think almost everything is positive coming out of that so I want to make sure that comes across before <laughs> before we get into any any criticisms um, you know I, but I agree with some of the comments that there probably does need to be flexibility I know our larger regions are undertaking a lot of initiatives aimed at, at many of the, the exact goals that, that the NOPER is trying to get across. Um, I, I can speak you know, for the Southwest Power Pool at least, they already do a, a 20 year plan, uh, scenario based planning. Um, you know, it's, it's probably more of a strategic initiative to see where things are going and not so much um, to identify projects that actually will be built. We, we identify those in our 10 year plan usually. 
Um, but it, it is already doing a part of what the, the NOPR wants. I think it repeats on a five-year basis rather than a three-year basis. Um, so I, yeah, I say all of that just to say, um, I think we wanna be careful that um, we aren't making redundant requirements, that, that whatever is suggested by the NOPR can fit into strategic plans uh, that, the, that the RTOs are already undertaking. And so you know, while I certainly am not representing my region or, or RTO or any other RTO, I do think this is gonna be one case where you have entities that are strategically trying to move in the same direction FERC wants. There, I don't think you're in conflict. And so I would, I guess, urge you to take, you know, a very close look at what they put in their comments um, as far as you know, specific details or specific concerns they might have um, where they think they could be slowed down. Um, then the other specific comment I had is, I also appreciate, um, all the uh, attention paid to bringing the states in uh, and giving us more a seat at the table. I think that is a recognition of uh, a lot of what's going on in, in my region, in the Southwest Power Pool, and the fact that we have a seat at the table, we have specific authorities over cost allocation, um, over resource adequacy, um, and, and I, I think that needs to be extended, um, or, or I think it's a positive development if that is extended to others. The only concern I have is, um, I, I, it's not clear to me, but there are sections of the NOPR that seem to indicate uh, more involvement of the state regulators in the identification, planning, and selection of transmission projects. And while I think it is important for the regulators to be involved, um, to be brought in to some extent, to be educated on why the plans are occurring, um, I can foresee unintended consequences if the regulators are somehow involved in the selection of uh, planning process, because after all, we will have uh, state citing certification cases uh, as a follow on. And I certainly would not want an implication that I somehow am recused because I selected the, the, uh, the project through the regional planning process. And so um, it's, you know, I, I think I more flag it as a, an academic question of you know, how involved should state regulators be um, in, in selecting regional transmission plans. I think it's certainly fair for us to be involved in cost allocation um, and you know, broad policy questions like resource adequacy. But as far as uh, identifying specific lines, I wonder if we do need to maintain some separation um, between the independent uh, planner and the state regulators. Mr. Rafshoffen. Thank you. Oh, I also want to speak in general about the, the uh, direction of the NOPR. And I, I don't know if I can speak entirely for the West. I think this is a, a strong sentiment in the West. It's certainly California's position that we're very strongly supportive of the direction of the NOPR for, in many ways. And Chair Scripps and Chair French mentioned them, the focus on longer term planning, on scenario, a range of scenarios, the guidance to consider an expanded range of benefits and beneficiaries, the very strong role for states in the cost allocation process. These will really go a long way to making the process more effective and efficient. We certainly agree with retaining regional flexibility and I certainly agree with what Chair French said and I know Commissioner Christie has said this, it's, very important that whatever FERC does not interfere with the innovative activities or other efforts that the regions are already engaged in, uh, whether or not it's interconnection queue reform or transmission planning. Certainly the California ISOs are already doing things that are suggested uh, in the NOPR and, and it's important that they, be, they and other regions be allowed to continue uh, with those efforts. Two other points, uh, I wanna associate myself with, I think, what uh, Chair Nelson just said about benefits. I've said earlier today that we think it's important to have some minimum category of common benefits that FERC suggests and uh, provides guidance for the regions to do in their planning. Those could be common categories, and as Chair Nelson said, allowing the regions to value them differently. They can be defined differently, but that would greatly enhance the regional and interregional planning processes. And I won't repeat what I said earlier. And 
I, I do want to also support the notion of, of an independent transmission monitor, which was part of our ANOPR comments. It's not in this current NOPR. It's something that California, this is something that I, I, don't, I won't speak for the rest of the West, but we think it's something that could help ease cost pressure, provide cost containment, which is so needed. I just want to go on record, say keep that notion and that concept alive. I'd like to quickly echo what Chair French said with respect to the separation between the regulator and state planning process. There was litigation in Wisconsin regarding a MISO project where regulators were accused and they really weren't all that involved. It's very difficult for a state circuit judge. Well, the, it's incomprehensible to me sometimes. I wouldn't want to be a state uh, circuit judge trying to comprehend just how exactly the process works. So that's something uh, that should be considered. Thank you. Mr. Allen. I'll be, I'll be quick. I um, uh, mostly want to say and, and repeat the, the broad kind of support uh, of, you know, at least uh, myself for what's contained in, in NOPR. And I think Cliff had kind of outlined a lot of the elements that, that really kind of stand out as, uh, you know, really key and important. I think we'll make a a very significant uh, difference going forward. Uh, we will have small nits. I mean, it's, there's a lot of specificity in areas that, that we don't feel uh, needs that specificity. We think uh, there's opportunities for flexibilities. We, we, uh, we appreciate flexibility uh, broadly. I think that's consistent a message from Nehru, but I'm gonna, push a little bit back on, on that. I mean, I like the flexibility because it doesn't get in the way of progress that is already being made. And uh, it speaks to the kind of the laboratory of the states or the laboratories of the regions, uh, trying things and learning things and doing things a little bit differently is, is a constructive uh, thing. But that said, there are, there are times when you really need to kind of hold firm to the notion of um, some, some consistency, especially on the interregional stuff. But I, I also believe that, you know, a, a benefit that is not recognized in this process, process is going to be a lost opportunity. And uh, it's really, you know, from a consumer standpoint, it's important, I think, to, uh, uh, to provide at least the major categories. Uh, Cliff refers to a minimum set, but for the major categories of benefits, I, I think they should be there and they should be recognized. And I, I don't think we should be too concerned about establishing a minimum. Thank you. Chair LaVar. Thanks. Just briefly, you know, looking at this from the perspective of the portions of the West that aren't in an RTO. Um, First, I just want to say I'll, I'll join those that express appreciation. I think it's obvious FERC went to great lengths to try to preserve flexibility and state input in this, and, and it's obvious that a lot of listening and effort went into this NOPR. It's, it's fairly straightforward to me how this, how the 20-year planning horizon with three-year updates and the scenarios would be implemented into the current Northern Grid and West Connect process. The, the anchor data sets that WEC uses, the process they do, this, this, this would fit through that pretty intuitively where they don't do much cost allocation, it, it's, it's not hard to see how that would go forward. What I don't know, and I, and I hope stakeholders across the West are thinking about is, what impact this different planning scenario would have on momentum towards RTO development in the West. And, and, and that's something I've tried to, to think about, and after months I still have no, no idea what it means <laughs> to that. Um, but I just wanna raise it because I think it's a real issue, and, and may, you know, Maybe that should or shouldn't be anybody's objective, but I know a lot of the stakeholders in the West really want that momentum to keep happening. And I, I don't have a sense for what this new, new planning scenario would mean for that momentum. But I, but I do see how it would fit into the current paradigm. And if the goal is to improve the current paradigm, I think this does it. Any, any final thoughts on the planning portion of the NOPR? We've heard a lot of broad support for the thrust of it and a lot of the details in terms of a longer term multi-benefit 
scenario based, some questions still about where that fine line is between specificity and flexibility. Um, and some concerns about um, while appreciation of giving the states a significant role, but at a certain point in terms of project selection that may not um, be, be a good idea for the states, given that they also have citing authority um, as well. And then some thoughts to um, still consider um, an, uh, some kind of an independent uh, transmission monitor role. So, yeah, Commissioner Christie. Go on. <laughs> I'm not, a, I mean, unless I missed it, um, I could have, because it's about 300 pages. Um, I don't think there's anything in there that has state commissioners picking individual projects. There's, there's consenting to, to criteria, but not individual projects. Only if there's a state agreement approach, and it comes from your state as a policy, and classic example is New Jersey. I mean, their legislature said build offshore wind. That didn't conflict out the commissioners at the New Jersey BPU because that was a decision of their legislature. But so I don't think it's, there's anything in there has you as, in, as a regulator picking projects. It was more fo more focused on on develop, helping develop the criteria selection criteria. Yeah, the, the but those are not individual projects. I mean, individual projects are like New Jersey's offshore wind, and you're that's coming from their legislature, and it didn't conflict anybody out. And Ted, I think the one you mentioned was not about, say, legislators in Wisconsin taking that project. It was about potential communications, ex party communications. Oh. That was a different issue entirely. But Chair but, Scripps, I think we wanted to jump in there. Too. I'll defer it you want to <laughs> oh, go ahead. respond to that. Um, that was one of the issues that confused the case, but, but participation on the advisory committee, which talks about policy in front of MISO doesn't vote on projects was used as a basis for recusal. I know in the opinion there was all other kinds hmm. of, there were all other. Send me that opinion, please. I'd like to see that. Yeah, yeah. That, that, yeah. that would and knock out a lot of people and a lot of RTOs who yeah, are doing yeah, a lot of it, things today. Yeah, but it's so <laughs> difficult to, right. for anybody that's not in this process to describe it, that there's a meeting where we're talking about this stuff, the commissioners at the meeting, appearance oh, of bias. Oh, and there's no merit at all there but to try to get that message through to people unfamiliar with this process is challenging. No, you got to pay attention. And it would, it would potentially, like when, when PJM did, when OPSI did, and state agreement approach, all the commissioners were involved in that. I mean, it didn't yeah. conflict this out. Yeah. But I mean, that's a good I, yeah. point. I mean, but I, I'd, I'd love to hear that case and see there, that opinion. There's a Nehruk amicus, and I think maybe even a MISO amicus that would probably clearly lay it out without getting into all those side issues that we're also yeah, addressing. Yeah, I'd love, love to see it. I'll get Chair, that to Chair Scripps, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to sort of add the, the one piece in MISO that is preserved is that when it comes time for the vote on the planning advisory committee on which the OMS serves, um, we typically as OMS abstain from that because it's that is the process point at which the projects the specific projects are being approved and so we're abstaining right. from that but at the same time um, have been very involved in the development of the futures on which MISO ultimately develops the projects and and those are in fact designed I think to reflect sort of where states are and what the generation mix is and what and how it's changing and I think one option that FERC may have is sort of at a higher level in a, and in a way that preserves some of the flexibility that we've talked about is simply to require multiple scenarios. And those scenarios almost inherently will look different based on particular regions of the country. But when you look at what MISO has done as the starting point for its long range transmission planning projects, for example, it was based on three future scenarios. One was sort of status quo with um, sort of the statutory requirements and the results of uh, approved IRPs baked in. Uh, and then the others were sort of more aggressive and it was, we're not sure if it's future one or future three that we're living in, but how do you start then developing a, a suite of projects based on those? And those had very much uh, the ability for the states to input, but in a way that, that sort of reflected the specifics of the environment. So that may be one approach for preserving um, regional flexibility while also requiring that at least sort of at, at, a, at the start of the planning process that multiple scenarios are used. Sure, definitely. 
Um, I, I'm taking the conversation in a different direction, but you were about to wrap up and I wanted to, I, I'm not making any statements regarding the minimum set of benefits, but we did hear support for that from two commissioners and I'm just making the FERC commissioners aware that um, I don't believe that all the states are on, there are some states uh, that are opposed to that, but I'm not taking any position on it here today. Thank you. I was just about to add that I forgot that on my list. Oh. Okay. Um, Chair Thomas. Um, I, I would add that I think the NOPERS approach on benefits is the correct approach. I think the optimal case, what you want is rather than diminishing commitment to, to quantifiable and verifiable that you need rigorous examination just to stretch the benefits as far as, as you can with that rigorous examination. And I think the NOPER does that by the way the list is and the methodologies are. And as each region examines what it wants to do with that list, I think they'll, they'll create you know, a data point for other regions to examine it. And I think that's the best way to get to the end goal of stretching benefits, but maintaining a commitment to to quantifiable and verifiable. Thank you. Commissioner Clements. Two quick points. One is on the flexibility front. You know, the rule bill, the proposal builds in a lot of flexibility in general for regions to to um, get at these goals in the way that they want. There is also what I've been hearing this week, this question about, uh, I think you said this, Chair French, you know, some of the regions are doing good things and do they qualify? And I would just request that people be very specific about what they mean, because just kind of generically, flexibility is good and we want more doesn't help us understand whether or not a study that's a scenario planning study that's done for an educational purpose versus a planning process um, is happening and, and how that relates to what we propose in the rule. The second point is on the uh, independent transmission uh, monitor, we are holding a technical conference in October and the deadline for self dominations is August 1st to talk about how we get at the issue of cost management and cost containment related to this, what we're talking about, you know, which if successful should incur a significant amount of required investment and what that means for customers. There is a significant need to get specific around what an independent transmission monitor looks like in an RTO region and a non-RTO region and what that means. So I would encourage you all to at least uh, pay attention to that technical conference and please participate if you're interested. Commissioner Downey. I just wanna say I completely agree with what Commissioner Clement said to the extent to which you believe that your processes are either duplicative of the, of the components of the NOPER or maybe even aren't duplicative, but you think um, offer better solutions, it would be very useful for us to have that information explicitly laid out for us. So I, I couldn't agree more. Great, on to cost allocation. So um, we'll hear from uh, Chair Brown Dutrell, Chair Duffley, and Commissioner Allen, and then we'll open it up. Thank you. <laughs> Let me just say, I also echo the comments and remarks of my other fellow commissioners in stating that we are very pleased in terms of the direction and tone of the NOPER, very appreciative because it you did put a lot of effort into understanding and hearing the concerns that were expressed by not only us, but other people that uh, offered comments. On, on um, cost allocation, I, I just have a couple things to remark. I, I also appreciate the um, reflection in the NOPER in terms of uh, state agreements and, and allowing for that flexibility you know, PJM has a, the state agreement approach, and um, we have been we have used that in one project. Um, so very happy and appreciative of that. One thing I would like to note out uh, to note, just hoping that, and so I hear Commissioner Danley. So hoping that it's it doesn't reflect that we would have to go back and uh, redo that at all. So. I, I would just throw it out there. 
I will say I appreciate the comment of Commissioner Christie in terms of the clarification from Chair French in terms of uh, states participating in some type of state agreement approach and making sure it doesn't impact any state authority that we have in terms of citing because I thought I thought the same thing so that was part of my my comment so that is important to um, have that clarification I do thank you for it. in terms of clarification also one of the things I wanted to point out was um, would ask that FERC provide some clarification or as much as possible with respect to the cost allocation method and the state agreement process the ex ante and the ex post process that's described in footnote 508 and 509 was a little vague and uh, hopefully in any comments that are provided you can provide some clarification i i do want to throw in there i, I think it's part of the planning pro Part, but it's part of my comments in terms of the folk. Uh, I do support FERC's proposal to consider an expanded set of benefits, both in the transmission planning and the, the cost allocation process, processes. I also support that the list of minimum benefits to be considered is neither mandatory nor exclusive. I do have some concern that the list of potential benefit metrics includes metrics that may double count the same benefit twice. So I just throw that out there. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to comment on one area, and it involves uh, the state involvement provisions regarding cost allocation. I'm supportive of providing the states a formal role in the development of the cost allocation methods to be used for this new bucket of transmission. It will allow the states to negotiate on the front end and come to consensus and attempt to resolve problems before they are problems versus through court proceedings after the fact. The maximum flexibility provided by the Commission regarding cost allocation is welcomed, including the provision that allows states the opportunity to negotiate a different cost allocation method from any ex ante cost allocation method filed in a transmission owner's compliance filing for unique or one off type of projects. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so I'll just make a couple points on cost allocation. Uh, again, broad agreement. Um, uh, allocating costs according to benefits uh, per FERC 1000 uh, continues to resonate. Uh, I do think that the benefit categories that are used for cost allocation should um, be symmetric or in some way reflect the character of the benefits that are used for, for planning. Uh, so I think there should be just consistency uh, there in the process. Um, I, I like the uh, ex ante ex uh, post uh, approach. I um, I think there is a you know there is a twist on it that you know is kind of interesting, which is uh, there's some talk of a backstop and uh, you know whether a backstop might be needed to help kind of motivate or um, <clears throat> encourage um, a faster agreement on uh, either an ex post or an ex ante. Framework and the way I think about it is, uh, if, if there is indeed a backstop, it would be good if that backstop were created uh, regionally, and I, I think optionally allow the regions to consider the ex ante uh, approach uh, as the backstop to you know a forward-looking uh, ex post approach. I'll uh, I'll stop there. Thanks. We are open for others who want to uh, who either comment on what you just heard ahead or add some of your own perspective on the cost allocation in the notebook. Chair Stanek. I'd just like to add on what uh, Commissioner Duffley just referenced with respect to allowing the states an opportunity to work on cost allocation amongst them, themselves. And in some respects, when I first read the notebook, I felt like the, the dog that, that caught the the car. So be careful what you wish for, because <laughs> Ferg is saying, if you want a seat at the table, pull up a chair 
and you have 90 days to sort it out amongst yourselves. I, I don't know if 90 days is, is, is the right number. Um, I am fearful that if, if, if you give the states 90 days, they'll use 90 days. If you give them 180 days, they'll use 180 days. Uh, but again, following up uh, what Mark Christie said yesterday, it's an opportunity. We're all busy, focused inward on our state's needs. Uh, but this is a rare opportunity where I've, I've seen FERC extend a hand um, or share some of the burden with their, their state co counterparts to, uh, to figure out the, this issue. So whether it be two states or five states come together, um, there needs to be a clock. I just don't know if 90 days is the right amount of time, um, but I, I welcome that challenge. Others, Chair Thomas. Um, to follow up on Chair Dutrell's comment in terms of the vagueness, there's one issue I think that should be examined, and that is, it is retention of 205 rights. I think it's clear that the states have 205 rights to file, but then what happens? Do they retain those 205 rights if they want to do a subsequent change over time? Uh, I hope that, that that can be clarified, that, that it's not a one a one-time grant that that's something that continues over the life of the tariff. Thank you. Others want to jump in, particularly any other concerns with the cost allocation as it's laid out and the role of state in particular? Okay. Any questions from the FERC commissioners of the states on cost allocation? Commissioner Danley. I guess I would just say that because this is, as you said, a, a unique example of the uh, hand being extended by FERC and the states are not typically drafted into these sorts of uh, roles very typically, we are kind of forging slightly new territory and there are a lot of details for how this is gonna to have to work out that are gonna take a lot, a lot of thinking through and I think probably a lot of false starts if it's finalized and actually implemented. So to the extent to which, and this goes along the lines of the last comment I made, to the extent to which you are thinking through what it's going to look like and you have lingering doubts, certainly it's informative for us to chat here, but nothing that any of us say that's not in a FERC order is actually what the law is going to be. And so you need to satisfy um, your, your curiosity as to what the NOPER means and what your role is going to be by actually filing either hearings or clarification requests or whatever it is, whatever you feel, feel the correct vehicle is to ensure that you know what you're, you're going to be, what's going to be expected of you. So I, I just, uh, this is yet another pitch for me to try to get people to file as much information and also as many questions and queries as they have to make sure that they understand what's, what the NOPER is going to require of them once finalized. Okay, so we're going to move on to the uh, the other bucket, which is anything else in the NOPR that you want to respond to. And Commissioner Rakshoff, and you've signed up to talk about a few things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would feel insulted if I'm, I can't be batting cleanup, but because there's a batting seventh, but even Willie Mays at the end of his career batted six. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I want to talk about two issues. The first is ROFR, and I don't think we have, I can't say we have consensus in the West about this. We, 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 we floated this, we discussed this idea at a WE meeting, but we didn't really have consensus, but I can speak for myself and the PUC. And, uh, we uh, strongly oppose the idea of a conditional ROFR. Uh, we think it's a step backwards that would have a practical effect of limiting competition and giving incumbent utilities too much ability to restrict access to other market participants. So I'm putting my flag there. I'm, uh, uh, that's, that's our view. We've had experience with competitive bidding in California. It's worked. Uh, it's reduced prices. It's been successful. We have a lot of regional, regionally cost allocated projects. Um, there's no real evidence that in states with ROFRs uh, that they have more regional projects or that costs are lower. In fact, costs are higher and maybe unjust in, in, in those states. There are very legitimate concerns. Chair Stanek raised them and others have raised them about the unanticipated effects of the, the ROFR policy in place. But 
Our view is there are better ways to get at this. There's other competitive reforms that should be undertaken to promote competition rather than restore a conditional no fur. And at a minimum, our recommendation is that, this, that FERC leave it up to each state to determine whether or not each tra transmission should be developed competitively. Uh, this actually is consistent with a recommendation from the National Regulatory Research Institute, which is NARUC's research arm. They did a white paper on this in 2013 and basically said, let every region decide if, if this is promoted, if, if competition is, is beneficial or not, and move forward from there. Another alternative is for FERC to take a look at other ideas for uh, competition reform in a future stakeholder conference and focus more specifically on alternative proposals for expanding competition. So that's ROFR. The second point, I'm not going to talk about construction works in progress, so for those of you who stayed till the end for that, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> We're very supportive of the transparency proposals for the local transmission planning process, and I think Nehru's comments are going to uh, reflect that. We do have a, a, a suggestion, recommendation, which is to clarify that this process should also extend to repair and replacement projects, which uh, which don't expand the capacity of the grid or do so incidentally. Um, right now, these projects, we call them utility self-approved projects. They may be called supplemental projects. They're not reviewed at all in the regional process or very cursorily. They're, they represent half of all IOU transmission spending and FERC jurisdictional RTOs and ISOs. So that half of everything. And just to give you an, an example, in California, in 2022, our largest utility, PG&E, they forecast $1.2 billion on capital spending. 88% of that will be spent on utility self-improved projects, so it, which evade any kind of regional review. We heard a similar story yesterday on a panel from Greg Poulos of the Consumer Advocates of PJM. He said a great majority of projects in PGM are supplemental, not subject to PGM review. I followed up with him. He said, and he got, we got, I got some statistics after this, his talk. It's, it's about 70% and it's billions, billions of dollars a year. So ideally, we think FERC should require that all projects above a certain threshold, regional, local, self-approved projects, supplemental, be reviewed and approved in uh, the transmission plan, in the regional transmission planning process. Um, so those are that's one uh, one concrete suggestion. The other su the other suggested reforms in the NOPA are are, are valuable and important, and, and we certainly should support them. But we would go further. So others want to comment either on what the commissioner just said or add some other. Uh, other other things as well. Yeah, uh, I will hit uh, Chair quick Thomas thing. and uh, construction work in progress. Rather than that having that rolled in to rate base and recovered at as as it is incurred, uh, the better way to do it, as suggested by the NOPER, is to put it into AFUDC after the project is used and useful thereby protecting the rate payers from the risk that the project is not completed. So we support, I support the NOPA on uh, proposal on QIP. Thank you. Thanks, I'll get a drink. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Danley. This was just a clarification. I, I may have missed it, I'm sorry. What did you say the threshold was that you were, uh, that you were proposing? I apologize. Well, it, it, we don't have a magic number. We. I think we're going to. Oh, okay. I was looking for the magic number. Three okay. million dollars. Right. Okay. okay, fine. All right. But, gotcha. So I did. I didn't miss it. You didn't give it. Good. I, I feel reassured. I think that's what I. I don't want to put. Yes, yeah, three, million. three million. Did you want to follow up on that? Yep. Go ahead. Magic number, but um, the issue of local projects is a huge issue in terms of cost, and we're having a technical conference on October sixth. Do you really want to? We're sending. We've nominated. Yeah, and that's the kind of issue there. that could be aired out. 
Absolutely. And I think in PJM it's actually 80% of the budget. $82, I think. Big, big number. Chair French. I only raised my card to add a hearty me too to everything Cliff said um, on both the local planning issue um, and, and scrutinizing those. I mean, we, we have no doubt that a lot of that infrastructure needs to be replaced. Um, the question is, what do you replace it with? And are you finding, you know, are you replacing it with the same thing that you put there 80 or 90 years ago? Um, and is that really the grid of the future? Um, and then on uh, right of first refusal, you know, my thoughts are very complicated on that issue, but um, we have seen tremendous cost savings in our region as well over the last few years on, on several projects, and it seems the wrong time to turn away from that. So um, I would, would endorse everything uh, Commissioner Rickshop had to say on that. Others want to comment on the RFR issue or anything else? Yep. Well, I will do a ditto with um, Commissioner Chair Thomas on the QIP, and I support that position as well. Because these are long-term projects, there's a lot of speculation surrounding it. AFUDC makes more sense. Others? Okay. Well, I think that we're going to turn it to the co-chairs to adjourn, just say that I think we had another productive uh, meeting today on, on in a regional and then some feedback that I hope was helpful on um, on the first NOPER. And um, we'll be talking about whether we want to have the next at the beginning end of a NARUC meeting or something independent from a NARUC meeting. Um, when we're thinking about the next meeting. Thank you, Dr. Rob. I will be brief. I thought today's meeting was very constructive. We all know that the relationship between the uh, state commissioners and FERC has not always been as open and collaborative as I think we have been over the past eight months. It's really hard to be frustrated with, with FERC when they're actually listening to you <laughs> so intently uh, <laughs> as they have been. And I hope my federal colleagues have heard from the state commissioners today that there's uh, broad and general support for the uh, cost allocation and transmission planning NOPR. Um, also like to recognize that FERC issued an order last Friday, which accepted our second slate of uh, uh, commissioners to participate for year number two. Uh, there has been one change. I'd like to recognize and thank my colleague, Cliff uh, Rekshefen, for the past year of his service on the, the commission. These commissioners, the state commissioners, have been working weekly up, up as long as three hours a, a week on these issues for the past year. Uh, they put in a lot of time and effort uh, getting prepared for these meetings, for helping draft some of the ANOPR comments and now the, the NOPR comments. So Cliff, thank you very much for your, your service. Um, selfishly, the California PUC uh, staff that have been supporting Cliff have been terrific and I'm glad they'll be staying on because the replacement uh, Ms. Darcy Hauk, who's uh, here in the audience today, she will be replacing Cliff as the uh, uh, second Western representative. So thank you again for your service, and we look forward to uh, Darcy joining the, the table. Thank you. Well, thanks. I, I, just, I first wanted to echo what uh, Chair Stanek said. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Rex Effin, for uh, putting all the time and effort. I know you all, from I think for commissioners, we're kind of freewheeling it sometimes because we can't all meet in advance to talk about these things. But you all, I know, spend a lot of time under Chair Stanek's leadership uh, getting ready, and it, it shows. It shows in, in, in the discussions that we've been having, and I hope, I think it's, it shows in the input that you all have had in terms of our uh, rulemaking processes to date, and I'm sure that will we'll continue. Um, and also, I don't want to, I want to uh, mention Commissioner Raper as well that left the Idaho Commission and was replaced by Commissioner Lavar, but uh, thank her for her service and I, I think it's really notable that as mentioned we're only having one new commissioner because uh, Commissioner Rassefin is uh, term limited you know, from his position but um, everyone else signed up for a second term <laughs> with all the hard work <laughs> <laughs> and that says a lot about you all and, and, and your willingness to, to, to continue this effort and I, I feel really good about that and I know my colleagues do it as well so thank you all for, for agreeing to 
to, to do this again. And wanted to thank Dr. Rob again for great work in moderating and also everybody for the good discussion today. I think it's going to have a big impact on our next um, regulatory endeavor. And I would say that Commissioner Danley is exactly right. We want as many comments as we can and your input. And uh, But I will also say that not just the things you don't like, don't hesitate to say the things that you like as well. <laughs> we like yeah, to hear uh, just for the record, I agree with you. Yes. <laughs> even, yes. <laughs> Positive reinforcement is good sometimes. <laughs> but again, thank you so much for everything. And, and uh, I know that our next uh, meeting is going to be in, uh, in November at the next network meetings. And we'll consult with you all about uh, topics before we, uh, before we announce that. But look forward to seeing you all in New Orleans. Thank you. Have a great rest of the summer. And we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Well, hopefully I will see you in some